Speedruns can be very confusing, especially the Zelda franchise, which has so many glitches at this point, you don't even know what's going on half of the time. So today, I'll be covering the entire Wind Waker 100% speedrun, and it will all be fully commentated, so all of the tricks and glitches will be explained. So, with that being said, I hope you enjoyed this video, and please, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel for more awesome Zelda content like this. With that being said, let's get right into it. Let's start this run in 3, 2, one and go so we are finally past the like four minutes of intro cutscenes and we are now ready to get into the actual game now if you've never watched the wind waker speedrun before enjoy but if you have you're most likely seen on any percent run on either this channel before or a gdq stream of sorts and the objective of those is to beat the game as fast as possible and even though there will be some similarities in the early game here uh, this category is going to be very different because since it's 100%, I still have to get all of the items at some point. Meaning, for example, at outset, I will need the um, telescope, I will need my tunic, among a bunch of other items. So my objective right now is to leave outset as quickly as I can, but not progress my game into a late game state. We'll get into that later. Either way. The first objective right now, then, is going to be to get off of this island. And as a casual, I would have to watch a lot of cutscenes. It's about 20 minutes of cutscenes to get out of here. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to attempt to perform a glitch known as a manual super swim. Now, a lot of these glitches are so complicated to explain that I would not be able to do them in a full live commentary. So I'm going to try a lot of examples from other games to hopefully make this more easy to understand. So when it comes to the manual super swim glitch, first of all, what is the glitch? Well, it's going to look like this. So as you can see, I am furiously mashing my analog stick extremely quickly, and Link is moving like this. So you're probably very confused what's happening right now. What you're going to see now once I stop flicking my analog stick is that when I go here, you can see the Link is facing up left, but he is swimming very fast backwards. So when Link swims around in the ocean, right, he will continuously gain more and more speed until he hits a speed cap, which is around 28 units. Once he hits this, he cannot gain any more speed. But to add some realism to how the swimming mechanic works, when Link turns around, the game wants him to lose some of the speed that he currently has. Because he doesn't want you to be able to, you know, turn around back and forth at full speed. So how the developers implemented you slowing down is that it adds three units of negative speed. Basically the equivalent of backward speed. Why is this important? Well, the developers never considered that the player might attempt to just go backwards. So even though they put a speed cap for how fast Link can go forward, they never put a speed cap for how fast he can go backwards. What that means is that if you turn around frame perfectly over and over again, Link's speed will exponentially be increased in the backwards momentum, so in the negatives. So we will do that over and over and over again just like backwards long jumps in Super Mario 64. And then I have to pause my for my game for the remaining speed. And my objective right here is to get at least around 500 units of speed. So now I've reached about 500 units of speed. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter target camera and then hold up on my analog stick. And what you're gonna see is that Link is now facing me, but the camera behind him is turning around like crazy. And that is because once you have this much speed, 500 units, Link moves so quickly in the backwards momentum that he will turn from the middle of the screen to pass the camera in a single frame. And since the camera always has to face Link, that will result in a situation where the camera will just basically turn around for you, making you turn around frame perfectly even more. Then I go to that corner right there to get an air refill. So I get even more air and now have all of my speed. And this should give me enough time without drowning to go all the way from outside island to Dragon Roost. And this is one of the main reasons why Wind Waker is such a hard game to pick up for speed running. Because this trick is brutal. It takes weeks to just get the first trick down. But if you're able to do it, it leads to an incredible speed run. 
Um, but once we're at Dragon Roost Night now, thankfully, we will have a little bit of a calm time, at least until we get into the next dungeon. But there's still a couple of cool tricks and random 100% stuff as well that we can look forward to. And there we go. Now, the Windbreaker is going to be one of the most broken items that we have in the game. I'm going to get to that later. But the first thing we want to do is get into Dragon Roost. Now, you're supposed to go to the left and break a bunch of rocks and kind of sidle along a bunch of things. But if you get up on top of that rock and you have a very precise angle and roll off of it, you can actually get a full speed jump, even though you're not supposed to. And that lets you just ledge crab right there. And then you can jump past the second rock, immediately enter this cutscene with a bird, and get access to the main island of Dragon Roost without having to do the side quest of going around Dragon Roost to get access to this point. Uh, after that, I'm just going to go through a couple of cutscenes right here, and then I'm going to step inside of Dragon Roost, have another long cutscene, and finally receive receive my delivery bag. Now, once we finally control, we are going to roll up these staircase, hopefully not talk to the Rados by accident. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the letter from Medley, and this is going to be used to access Dragon Roost later on. Now, before going down to her brother to deliver this letter, um, I have to do a quick side stop, and this is part of the 100% requirement. So this is a mail game. Now, you have to play this a total of four times. Three times, you just kind of prove that you're really good at this and the person sucks. Uh, and it requires you to beat the high score of, I think it's 10, 20, and 25. Once you beat it the third time for 25, he's basically going to say, wow, I suck at this and I'm going to hire an assistant. Uh, and then you can come back in here to play it a fourth time. And if you beat the assistant by getting at least 26, which as a speedrunner, I should easily be able to. I mean, I'm talking through this whole thing and I easily beat it. Uh, he will give you a letter, and this letter will result in you receiving a heart piece later on. And three out of three. There we go. Okay. So now we're going to quickly leave this area so he has time to hire an assistant. By the way, this is how long it definitely takes to hire an assistant. Just walk out and then walk right back in. And uh, yeah, 10 seconds is all it takes to hire someone in Hyrule. <laughs> they have a good economy. Anyways, now he has to beat this one last time for the reward. And there we go. 30, that easily beats the score of 26. We will receive our letter, which is the reward. We're going to mail this on later on. And then we, now we just have to deliver the last letter inside of here. And this is the letter that Medley gave us. So I'm going to roll down here, equip my Wind Waker, and take out the letter. Then we're going to enter this room for where the prince is. I'm gonna hand him the letter. Once we have that, we can then kind of go rescue Medley, get our small bottle, uh, get the bomb flower, explode it to get access to Dragon Roost, and then we will enter the dungeon. But before we get into the first dungeon, I gotta pay the bill somehow. So a quick word from today's sponsor. 2024 is here, and you want to start the year off in the wrong way, which is why I recommend you to check out the performance package 5.0. Ultra. Now, this package comes with amazing accessories. First of all, the Lawnmower 5.0 Ultra. Now, this trimmer is hands down the best one on the market. Not only is it a slick trimmer, but it also offers this incredible shield that avoids any cuts or nits when you want to have a nice shape. It's also super easy to use, and it comes with LED lights and a USB C for charging. Just absolutely incredible. Then there's the Weedbacker 2.0, which is an ear and nose hair trimmer. And I mean, this is pretty self explanatory, right? You don't want to show up anything with hair sticking out of your nose. So, this one is an easy bet. But that is not all that this package offers. It also comes with a crop soother and a crop preserver to help you get that perfect skin and perfect shape. And best of all, it also comes with two free goodies, which is a pair of boxers and a nice pouch to travel with and keep your accessories in. And best of all, if you go to manscaped.com slash Linka7 or use promo code Linka7, you'll get 20% off our order plus free shipping. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description of this video and thank you so much Manscaped for sponsoring this video. So, Dragon Roost, one of the first dungeons that is going to be a little bit different than what you would expect. So first of all, a kind of an obvious one is I do not have a sword right now, meaning I have to get through this entire dungeon without a sword. But my second problem is that this is 100% which means that not only do I have to, you know, just beat the dungeon, but I also have to get, you know, heart pieces, heart containers, and treasure shards, any kind of bonus items that exist within a dungeon. Now, 
the only way this is going to be possible is with different kinds of glitches. And thankfully, there is going to be a lot of them throughout this. So the first thing, I'm actually going to slow down here just to kind of show you one thing that's very important. And that is the glitch known as storage. So storage basically works by abusing the Wind Waker. So the Wind Waker always has to face Link. That means that if you climb up a ledge and you take out the Wind Waker right as you climb up, because he turns around, he will fall. So you can do what's known as a Wind Waker dive. I want to take advantage of an exploit where Link's legs do an animation where he prepares for landing. So if you pay very close attention to Link's legs right here, you're going to notice that he kind of does a huh right there. That happens exactly three frames, so a split second before you land on the ground. Now, if I press my B button exactly three frames before I land, this will happen, where I cancel my Wind Waker, but it is still out in my hand, as you can see. What that results in is that I can press B to cancel it a second time. And that means that the game will remember that I have, that I, I'm kind of like in a, I almost imagine it's like a minus one. Meaning the next time the game wants to change my state for anything, like taking out the Wind Waker, it will stay in a kind of playable state. So you can see I can walk around with my Wind Waker in my hand, right? Which I shouldn't be able to. And that can be used for a lot of different situations. So one right here immediately is a cutscene is supposed to play, but with storage, you can see the camera snap like that. That's because the camera tried, the cutscene tried to play, but because it had remembered that I had gotten storage, so the next time the game tries to change my state for anything, it had to revert back to the playable state. Um, and there's a lot of things in this game. Kind of imagine that any time you have some form of restriction on the player, it wants to change your state, to simplify it. That will mean like playing an instrument, a text box, you know, limits you in some regard, opening up a door, opening up a chest, a cutscene, anything like that. Anything like that can be affected by the storage glitch. And that is the fundamental principle that will completely destroy this game. I know that it's a lot to understand, but I think it will make more sense why it's so useful. Because if you're just looking at it kind of from, you know, like a wide lens, it might seem like you would just be able to walk around with text on the screen or skip a few cutscenes here and there. But being able to interrupt certain actions or have access to a uh, moving link around during certain interactions will have a huge effect on this game. So the first one will actually happen right now. So I'm going to uh, perform this storage glitch again right here against this pod right there. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and open this chest up. But what happens instead of doing the animation is it gets interrupted. And you can also see the screen goes completely pitch black. And that's because it is a special item. So it's doing this kind of fade out thing. Now, that's cool and all, but why would I bother doing that, right? And why am I going backwards instead of forward here? Well, that's where the beauty of Wind Waker speedrun glitches comes into play. So when it comes to Wind Waker, they had a lot of kind of tricky behind the scenes thing to make certain actions work that are very janky when you think about it, but it behaves perfectly if you don't use glitches. If you try and walk up towards a chest, right? You won't even get close to it. But when you open one up, you get super close, right? Because he has to perform the animation. So what the developers did is they shrunk Link's hitbox temporarily during that animation, and then it reverts you back to normal once it's done. Why is that so important? Well, with a small hitbox, I can do this. Since my hitbox is so small right now, I can walk up a wall that normally I would never be able to walk up otherwise because, well, my hitbox would be way too big to be able to consider this to be valid ground to stand on. But with a tiny hitbox, this is totally valid. So this lets me skip multiple rooms in Dragon Roos right there and just lets me skip a huge portion of the game. This can be used in all kinds of situations. This should probably give you a good demonstration as well of why the storage glitch is so incredibly powerful. Uh, by the way, I also promise I won't be continuing to kind of stop to explain things throughout this whole run. But for these like two or three fundamental glitches, I thought it was important to kind of slow down and really show you what's happening in a simplified explanation rather than just, you know, trying to make you figure out what's happening. But anyways, I'm going to go through these rooms and then here I'm going to place this bomb to open up this shortcut. 
Um, and that is because I want to be able to do this dungeon in what we like to call one trip, meaning I don't want to have to come back. And one of the treasure shards that would then be required for 100% is located at the bottom and should only be able to be accessed once you have the grappling hook, which is much later on in the dungeon. But what I can do with storage is pick up this rock, walk around the wall like this, and then just throw this rock to break the barricade, open up the chest, and by so, receiving my treasure chart. Uh, after this, I'm also going to make sure that I actually void out right here, because not only do I want to come back to the door, but this is another important thing to note when you store something from a chest you actually receive the item. And you will see that later on in the run, that I will sometimes to save time by not having to watch a slow, you know, chest open up, I will sometimes just kind of store the chest and then immediately just get crushed. And that's because anytime you void out or enter a loading zone, the item gets added to your inventory. So anytime I do that glitch with a chest, I will physically receive the item. It's just kind of being delayed, if that makes sense. Uh, but either way, after that, I go back to the main kind of first room of this dungeon. I use that war pot to get put back to the halfway point I was at. And now I can continue kind of like normal. So the first thing I'm going to do in this room is I want to take down these enemies right here. Then I'm going to pick up the stick right here. And I'm going to walk over to this torch. Now, if you light both of these torches, a secret uh, chest will spawn. And this will contain my second treasure shard of the run. Uh, and I should also clarify right away, because I don't think I've mentioned it, because there's a little bit of downtime right here. You might be wondering, what is the definition of 100%? So when I open up my pause screen, anything that is tracked in my pause screen um, is required. So that means every item, every item upgrade, all the pearls, the Triforce, all treasure charts, which is 49 of them for each one of the squares. Um, any kind of hidden abilities and upgrades like the hurricane spin. Basically anything you can think of that you would usually include in 100% is required. Now, thankfully, the game doesn't actually like track on the paw screen specifically if you have salvaged a treasure. So for the completely pointless like spoil spawns, I won't have to at least fish them up, but I do at least very still have to collect them. Because if I open up my paw screen, you can see right here, there is still a total counter. So I do need to hit that to 49. Now we're gonna go to the outside area and this is where the actual mini boss takes place. Um, and this should be pretty straightforward. It's gonna be using the same kind of combat that I've been using throughout this dungeon. So I throw a pot to make him drop the sword and then I will use the enemy's sword to actually fight the enemies. Wow, that grew some legs, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, take the last enemy down. Now I'm about to receive the grappling hook, which is a very good item in this speedrun. Before I pick it up, I'm going to get storage here again, and that is because the cutscene to receive the grappling hook is quite long. So by obtaining storage right here, what it lets me do is it lets me move around with the text boxes up, but not only that, after the text is uh, finished, a longer kind of cutscene is supposed to play of her talking to me more, but it gets completely skipped and it skips to the next portion of the cutscene, which is gives me the grappling hook and uh, we're now ready to move on. Right now where we are, we're actually kind of stuck because if I save and quit, um, I would be put back to outset actually. I'll get more into that later, but there's a lot of fail saves that I've skipped. And I don't have a sword to break this barricade in front of me. But this is a newer implemented kind of skip that was, let's say, recently found. It's really cool. So let me show how it works. It's not too difficult either. So I'm going to side hop and then I'm going to roll and do this setup to jump up on this little part of the grappable area. I'm going to side hop on top of this mountain and then roll here. Now I could just continue to walk out of bounds, but since this is a speed run, I'm just going to roll down and leave this area. Now, one really cool fun fact about that trick, by the way, is that even though that is newly implemented, it was actually rediscovered. That is apparently discovered by an old glitch hunter called Kazooie all the way back in, I think it was 2006. Um, but the community just forgot about it. And then a community name, uh, member rediscovered it recently, which made it be re-implemented into the run, which is really cool. But either way, right now, I want to beat the dungeon. Thankfully, there is an easy boss key skip. So I'm going to do the chest storage glitch that I just did earlier to clip inside of here out of bounds. And then I can just jump in between the out of bounds collision and the door, get straight into the loading zone, 
and we are now at the boss of the actual dungeon. Now, while we have some downtime and while we're fighting this, I also quickly want to mention, you might be wondering why the screen did not fade out to black, which just made this like really loud opening sound animation right there, while in the other room, it kind of faded out into black. And that is entirely dependent on what item I received. So if you're just getting like a kind of pointless item, Link just kind of turns around and does a quick item get animation. While on special items, I'm sure you all know the cutscene that takes place. You know, da -da 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 -da. When you get one of those, what actually happens is, you know, everything around Link kind of fades out into like a dark black one to give the shine animation of showing off the item to be very, very vivid and like in your face. Um, so if you store one of those special items, that's when the game actually uh, fades out like that. And sometimes I will make a conscious decision during the speedrun as well of picking which chest I will store based around that. Because if I have to walk a lot in one area, it might be really difficult to not see. Uh, but either way, this is going to be the third hit and uh, Goma will now become kind of vulnerable. However, Here's another cool little Wind Waker fun fact you might not have ever noticed because I think most people overlook this item. The grappling hook is one of the best items that I never used in my casual playthrough, but is incredible for speedruns. Not only does it let you grapple enemies to quickly get spoils from them without having to kill them, but also for multiple enemies, it actually deals damage. So. Instead of having a sword right here, I'm just going to grapple him over and over again, and he will go down very fast. Like, right now fast. That's it. That's the entire boss. There is no need to ever pick up the sword. And it's like, I'm, I'm geeking out right now, but it's just part of why like, I love this speedrun so much. It's just such a cool route, and just so many community members coming together to make runs like this possible. Uh, and I just love that, like, we beat, you know, the first dungeon before you probably would have even left the starting island with nothing but a grapple hook. I think it's just so cool. Uh, and also, here's our first heart container. Uh, hopefully, if I'm not Pega, I won't forget to pick up one of these, and uh, we should be good. And there's the first dungeon. Ooh. Now, once we're done with the cutscene, the next thing we're going to want to do in this speedrun is we want to get Wind's Requiem. And that is the song that lets you basically uh, change wind direction, which is going to be very important for 100%. So I'm going to perform a cutscene skip right here. And this one is very, very cool. So one thing you might not ever realize is that when you watch certain cutscenes or read certain things like this, Link actually turns invisible. And that is so that when you are like reading a tablet, you can see the tablet instead of like, you know, links back. So I take advantage of that by storing that. And then while the text box shows up, I read that letter. And that puts me in this weird kind of state where I have a delayed storage. So I get to start this, but then store the cutscene. And you can see the HUD gets glitched. This does still add the song to my inventory, but it gets to skip watching the cutscene. And once I've done that, I am now ready to continue. And this is when we get into the first, by the way, super sim of the run. So you're right here. I did the exact same thing I've been doing over again, which is storage. This time, however, I actually took out my Wind Waker. And you remember earlier in Dragon Roost, I showed you that I can walk around with my Wind Waker. That's all this glitch really is. Uh, it's just exploiting, once again, Nintendo doing janky stuff to make Nintendo mechanics work. So Nintendo obviously doesn't want the player to look at like Link's back when he's playing the Wind Waker. It always wants to face him in front of him. So what that means is that if you take out the Wind Waker, it will always face him. Like you can see right now, it faces him, right? And um, that what happens as a consequence of that is that if you're able to walk in that mode with the camera always being locked in front of you, if I enter the water and I hold up, when Link turns around, the camera turns around with you, which is exactly how the later portion of the manual super swim glitch worked. So that lets me build up speed in the negatives and perform super swims to anywhere I want without any really initial either setup or, you know, without destroying my hands flicking the analog stick. So I just spin around in the ocean for 15 seconds and then swim wherever I want. And right there, we just did a two coordinate super swim. Uh, to go all the way from Dragon Roost over to Windfall. And for some context, 
Uh, that would have probably taken about one minute, minute and 15-ish with optimal speed at best. Um, while, you know, it took us 20 seconds, 10 seconds to swim that distance. So it's a lot faster, not only due to not having to change the speed, but also for the super swimming purposes. Uh, and here's also our first introduction to Tingle. We're going to see a lot of him throughout this run. Uh, not only did he just give us an item that you should take note of, by the way, the Tingle Tuner. Remember that. It is going to be very important for later in the run. Um, but also, we are going to have to decipher charts later on. Uh, since this is 100% and we have to get the full Triforce. And he is definitely not going to hold back on any of the rupees. Uh, but after he leaves, I'm going to enter the behind of this jail cell. In case you don't know, there's a secret kind of maze. Uh, I recommend anybody to copy where I go if you ever want to know how to get through this. But either way, by going through this maze, um, you can find a secret little chamber where a telescope, not telescope, sorry, a picto box is located. Uh, and this picto box will be very important for multiple quests throughout the game, and it's an item. So we're going to get this quickly. Beautiful. And after picking up this Picto box, we are simply just going to leave. It's pretty straightforward. We're just going to crawl back here. We're going to take a wrong path on purpose. And if you ever wonder what happens, by the way, if you go the wrong path, there's basically a rat who just kind of laughs at you. Thank you very much. And then he pulls this string. You kind of fall down and you sploosh into the ocean right by windfall. And then, you know, you have to start over. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly go and talk to Miss Marie to set myself up later for some of the more side quests. And then I'm going to be moving on to what arguably is the most luck-based minigame in all of the Zelda franchise, which is called Sploosh Kaboom. I have an entire video dedicated to just how much it took to try and fix this. Because if you watched old runs or if you watched my randomizers, you will know that Sploosh Kaboom is entirely luck-based and is terrible. Thankfully, speedrunners have actually found a way to break this. So what I'm going to do now once I'm in the minigame is I'm going to throw the first game on purpose. It's kind of lucky to just figure out where they are. Then I'm going to basically put down into this kind of live updating spreadsheet slash document where the squids were. And this will then kind of give me an idea of where it's more likely, uh, statistically speaking, for the squids to be located. And then I'm basically just going to follow along and um, shoot. So that's a miss, miss. And once I do a couple of more misses like this, it should have a much better idea at figuring out exactly what kind of board I'm on. And you can see right there, I just hit all of them. And then we are ready to move on to the next one. Okay. So if you're wondering, by the way, why we're doing Sploosh Kaboom, um, we basically have to beat it because there are three item rewards here. You get one uh, reward for beating the game once, one for beating it twice, and then one for beating the game under 20, um, which is the high score. So I'm going to try to beat the game twice and both times beating the high score, because by doing that, I will basically get a lot of rupees as well. So it's a very, very good thing to try and do that. So, let's see here. Okay. And as you can see, almost perfect game 11. And there it is. So, you might be super confused of how this works. Now, I have an entire video, like I said, dedicated to explaining this, which I'll link in the top right corner if you want a lot of information. But I will just kind of clear off a couple of small things because you might be sitting here thinking almost like, wait, what, is this cheating? What's happening? Are you like looking at the game's code? Very long story short. Um,. The boards in the Sploosh Kaboom are always in the same order. Um, so by a lot of research, the community has figured out roughly where you are in the board's order on this specific route, 100% route, when you get to Sploosh Kaboom. So by then just telling the program, hey, this is the, you know, the first board I have, it can figure out instead of having to figure out, you know, like a hundred thousand possible board locations, it only has to figure out in between, you know, a few thousand, hey, which board is, you know, more likely to come up next. And by doing so, we can then kind of quite quickly and easily um, get through it. I'm also just going to mention quickly as well, if you're wondering, like, you know, isn't this cheating, etc., etc. Um, 
So the community has voted that it is allowed um, because you are manually inputting every bit of the information yourself. So if the information was like pre-existing, it wouldn't be. And if you want to run it without the program, it is actually still faster. It is statistic it is more fast to do without the program. So it's slower to use it. It's just more consistent. Uh, however, your odds are not in your favor. You have about a 20% chance to get a run past that with a two minute time loss. So about 80% of runs will die if you don't use the program. So yeah, 100% was completely dead of a category until uh, this, this program is figured out because having an 80% likely reset, and that's also by the way, still considering you're willing to take a two minute time loss. An hour in was not fun, but either way, uh, once I'm done with that, I'm going to, oh, after Sluskub and all that, sorry, the explanation was still a little bit long, but like I said, you should watch the video if you're interested on, like, how the actual reverse engineering took place and everything. But either way, uh, right here, I did something called a double storage. I basically got storage, and then while I had a text box on my screen, I got storage again. That let me store the cutscene of, you know, first time entering Forest Haven, uh, which avoids me from soft locking because the game does not like when you enter a cutscene in the camera lock super soon glitch. Then once I'm at Forest Haven right here, I'm going to perform a dive. That's unlucky. So you remember earlier when I mentioned that there are two parts to a storage. There is a Wind Waker dive portion and then canceling the Wind Waker to get storage. Well, you can just do the first portion, the dive, to actually go underneath islands, which I can do right here. Now, I'm very far underneath the island, and it should, like, seem completely useless. But there's another uh, failsafe that the game has that is to our advantage. So to guarantee that the player could never go underneath the ocean, if you're in a bottle of water and there's a water source above you, Link will be teleported to the water source above you. So we'll kind of just put us up like that. We completely skip all of, you know, like, the navigation around and then get put into Forest Haven, and now uh, we are ready to progress further. I am now located over here, and I now want to get my Deku Leaf. However, once you kill these enemies, you get a very long cutscene uh, talking to the Deku Tree before he spawns the Deku Leaf. So I'm going to attempt one of the harder glitches in this game, which is Deku Tree Cutscene Skip. So you can see that the Chews are acting very, very strangely right now. So what's happening right now is that the Chews basically have their AI disabled. So what I did is I bonked the tree to spawn the Chew Chews while I had storage active. That meant that they only activated going forward, but their AI of acting like enemies never actually started. That means that I can kind of push them out of bounds. And the reason that's so useful is because once a Chew gets out of bounds, he will go so far out of bounds that he will despawn. And him despawning will count as me having killed it. So I'm going to do this on all of the Chew Chews except for one that is located all the way here. And then I have to do this very precise thing where on a very specific time, I side hop and push him out of bounds. And then I count one, two, three, four, five, Six. And then walk under the head, get squished. And it worked. So what happened right there, if you timed it perfectly, is that the last Chew died by falling out of bounds at the same time that the Deku Tree's head crushed me. And because I voided out at the same time that the last Chew died, it started the cutscene, but immediately interrupted it by me basically dying. And that results in the DQ leaf spawning, the bulb spawning, but I never had to watch the cutscene. So that saves about two to three minutes right there. Uh, and then we can just climb the tree, go up and pick up the DQ leaf. Now you might be like watching this run and thinking, okay, Nintendo completely messed up. Uh, like they did nothing. They did put nothing in place to make sure you couldn't sequence break in this game. And you will actually be very wrong about that. Nintendo has a lot of safe flags in place to try and avoid you from sequence breaking. And I'm going to show you one of them right now. So I'm going to save and quit my game right here after I pick up the Deku Leaf. And you're going to notice something strange, which is that instead of spawning back to Forest Haven, where I should be, because that's where I saved, I'm actually all the way back to Outset. And that's because the game 
knows I shouldn't be past outset yet, so I'm not allowed to spawn back anywhere about outset. But that's actually been taken into consideration by the route and is what we use to get around the game faster. So we actually want to come back to obtain a couple of items that are required for 100%, but we also need to go up to this forest right here to get a rupee upgrade back. Now, usually in a normal playthrough, uh, you can't get this on your first trip. It's hidden underneath a ginormous like, kind of boulder and you need a bomb to explode it. But with glitches, there's always a way. And this is also why we want to get the Deku Leaf, by the way, as early as possible. Because the Deku Leaf opens up so many more explorations out of bounds. Because it means that we can navigate out of bounds even when there's no floors. So, I'm going to run here. I'm going to activate this enemy. And then we're going to do this weird setup right here. So, I'm going to double target here. Roll. Set up my angle. And then I'm going to attempt to basically grab this ledge. You can see how my right hand's partially inside the wall. This is basically what I want. Because this lets me do a frame-perfect glitch known as a roll clip. So by rolling on the first frame you climb up on the ledge, if you are partially out of bounds with your hand, Link will completely clip out of bounds. And from there... I can just use my leaf to leaf into the loading zone underneath the raw and obtain the wallet upgrade early. And we have now completely destroyed the order in which we should play this game. <laughs> then after I got the, uh, the rupee bag, I'm going to save and quit. And now we're actually going to go to grandma. Um, the tunic is actually technically not a required item in 100% speedrun because it does not get added to your inventory. It's just a cosmetic change in the overworld. However, you cannot obtain the telescope from your sister unless you pick up your tunic from grandma. So because of that, grandma is indeed required in the run. So we will actually visit grandma and we will accept her uh, birthday present, which is the green tunic. So unfortunately, no crab shirt. Uh, and for everyone who is wondering, if you're watching this on YouTube, you unfortunately can't speedrun on the Game Plus version. Uh, because it changes how the Triforce charts are actually located in the ocean. On some categories, it is allowed, but then it's usually slower, so you don't really want to do that. Now, after getting that, we're going to do a one quick detour right here by going underneath Grandma's house. Um, this is one of the first changes in between the Japanese version uh, and the North American one slash European one, which has basically the same items. In the international releases of this game, you will get a heart piece from completing all 50 floors in Savage Labyrinth. But on the Japanese version, instead, they give you the heart piece underneath Grandma's house, and the reward for beating all 50 floors is 10 rupees. They basically played a dirty one on all Japanese players by basically making fun of you for wasting your time and then saying basically I hope it was worth it and just giving you 10 rupees. So it's like a massive troll by completing all 50 floors. And this is another reason why Japanese is faster for the 100% speedrun because it means we don't have to do all 50 floors. We can just do the 30 because we know that the last upgrade is a total joke. And now is when the run starts to get really crazy, by the way. You might think it's already gotten really crazy, but trust me, you have not seen the first of it. So right now, I just obtained, right, my telescope. So what I should be doing right now is, you know, looking at the bird, activating the pirate ship from arriving here, and, you know, progressing throughout set. But we're not going to do that. So I'm going to change my wind direction to be upright. We're going to double target this ledge jump up turn around zoom in pause buffer a perfect camera change like this turn around again jump and then take out our leaf and now we're just gonna fly into the abyss and this looks like the most random thing ever we're just literally leafing towards the ocean there's nothing here this is where you can see how broken this game is so i'm actually going to stand on the air just open up an invisible door and I am now teleported into the pirate ship. <laughs> so to save memory on the GameCube version, the pirate ship is actually always loaded at the corner of the coordinate on outset, just too far to where you can normally swim and detect that it's there. But it is there. The collision is there. The loading zone is there. It's just invisible. So, by knowing as a speedrunner exactly where it is, I can use the leaf to just barely reach the pirate ship from the watchtower, land on it, and then just enter the loading zone, 
and it basically like rung warps me over to the pirate ship, which is located at Forsaken Fortress. So this lets me still get the spoil spag and the required items from Forsaken Fortress without having to go through all of the early game cutscenes. Then we're going to save and quit after getting the spoil spag, and we are now officially at the pirate ship. So, by the way, you notice how I quickly just got storage there and then pressed A in front of the door and then just left? Take note of that. But now, once we're at the pirate ship, we're just going to watch this long cutscene. I know you all love it. I'll give a short clip of the barrel cutscene. <laughs> and then after watching the barrel cutscene, we're just going to be shot over to Forsaken Fortress 1, just like it would in the vanilla game. And this cutscene, uh, to better way clarify, is required to be watched because this cutscene actually adds the map into your inventory. If you don't watch this cutscene, you never receive the map. Sploosh. Sword falls away. Oh yeah, by the way, that's our sword. Um, we never got the sword on outset, but the game just always assumes that you have the sword at some point, so it just drops it to you there anyways. So that's another reason we don't have to go through outset legitimately, because the sword just always spawns there. We also have here the Gossip Stone, and the Gossip Stone is actually a cutscene that can be skipped, but it is another cutscene that's very important for the internal flags of the game. So this is not just used as a cutscene to obtain the Gossip Stone. It is also used as a flag to indicate that you have progressed past the early parts of the game. So we pick that up not for the sake of getting the stone, but rather for progressing the game. But then what I'm going to do right here is I'm going to open up this door. Link is going to turn invisible. And then we're going to be back in the pirate ship. Yeah, so <laughs> by open by getting that Gossip Stone, the game goes, okay, he's past early game, cool. And one of those things that it does to the game internally is it tells it, because he's past early game, the next time he gets to the pirate ship, it should include the bombs. And that's very, very, very useful. Because what I did earlier is I got storage and I stored opening up that door. Uh, and what happens when you store a door is that you can't open it, but the next time you interact with any door in the game, it will just teleport you over to the door that you stored. So it kind of like rung warps us back to wherever we were previously located at. So that means that I can get back to the pirate ship, even though I should never be able to go back there, right? Because like now I'm stuck in the Forsaken Fortress and the pirate ship is far gone. And this lets me skip a lot of things in the game. Um, because bombs early is super broken. So I already have the early DQ leaf and the early bombs now. Once we are officially back to Forsaken Fortress 1, uh, Tingle is actually going to make his first appearance in the run. So we are going to use the Tingle tuner and connect our Game Boy Advanced. Now, if you remember earlier, I mentioned that you have a couple of items that can be purchased from the overpriced Tingle shop. Most of them are just not useful at all, but... In a few situations, it is useful. So right now, I want to get through Forsaken Fortress as quickly as I can. However, if you look in the top left, I have like no magic. And the only way that you can easily break this dungeon is by using the leaf. Because you're not supposed to have the leaf yet at this point. So I'm going to select a green potion on my Game Boy Advance right there. And then we're going to continue playing and we're going to go the completely wrong way. This is not the way you should be going if you want to go ahead and try and beat the dungeon. I'm going to go ahead and go right here. And then once I am here, I'm now going to initiate purchasing an item. Now, purchasing an item takes about 10 seconds or so. So he's actually going on in the background if you listen carefully right now. And you're going to see if you look at my magic bar here. Bam. Right as I run out, the green potion kicks in, and I now actually have magic to make this gap. So I get past that gap, I get some extra magic, I'm gonna use it a second time to get even more uh, magic, and that is gonna be used to skip, skip past these sections here. Now, there's still one key point that I missed out on in this area, which is I never took care of this watchtower, and this is the only mandatory watchtower you have to take care of. Thankfully, with a very precise movement here, see if I get it. Okay. 
you can just barely get underneath it it's it might not look precise but it's very precise and if you miss it you lose a lot of time so you can just barely get past it and then skip the watchtower completely so that means that i got to skip the entirety of the dungeon i can get to the end I can pick up my sword. That's for sake Gorgeous one for us. So now we are over at Windfall Island. We have gone through all of the cutscenes. And once we are here now, there's a couple of different side quests that I need to do. And I'm going to try and basically combine multiple side quests into one. So first I'm going to do is I'm going to activate the side quest of catching the killer beast. It's basically these four kids. They hide around and it's like hide and seek. But there's other quests going on too so you can see that npc walking right there that guy is on a super slow four minute cycle and i need to take a picture of him mailing a letter uh i need to take a picture of anton looking at linda right there underneath me so there's a lot of things that you can do while those cycles are happening so i'm gonna try and combine basically four quests all into one so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to change the wind while storage is active so the in-game time doesn't pause. And that is necessary so that the tower here with the windmill actually can start. It can only start if the wind direction is up or down. And then we're going to activate it. And you can see that it skips the cutscene. We're going to activate this cutscene. And this cutscene right here is basically how you obtain Song of Passing or Sun Song. Uh, which, whichever name you prefer. In this game, it's Song of Passing. And this will be very useful later on, especially if we need to do certain quests during only day or night. Plus, it's required for 100%. So we're gonna pow! We're gonna dance with this guy until the night. <laughs> and then we're gonna start actually the first killer bee quest right here. I'm also gonna enter and then leave this boat. And I have to do that for basically making it possible to use King of Red Lions. It's just like a strange flag that would normally be unlocked if you play the game legitimately but since i super swim i have to go in the boat at some point so i do it right there then we're going to catch the second one and throughout me doing all this by the way the npcs are walking around so i can't be too slow because i do have to take pictures of them walking around and i'm also trying to obtain rupees as well so that i have money for later this game is very expensive in terms of making purchases and then right here i'm going to change my wind direction one last time to what i actually want it to be later on We'll get the third kid right here. And then after we've done all of that, we now thankfully made this cycle from the looks of things. So now we just have to wait for him to appear basically. So I'm gonna stand at the edge here and uh, take a picture of him mailing this letter. And this is the second one uh, picture that we need. And this is by the way to become the assistant so you can get the deluxe picto box. So we're gonna save that picture. And then if we go here, the third picture will take place right here where Anton will walk up and look at her. Um, it looks like I had a little bit bad luck. Anton can randomly stop at any point and just stand around for five seconds and just choose to just hang out <clears throat> like that. Thank you for the demonstration. Uh, up to five seconds. Thankfully, that was just worth one. Either way, so if you get perfect luck, he's already there. But if he decides he wants to stop around and look around for a bit, then... <laughs> You might have to wait for him for a little bit, but yeah, that's the three pictures. And now we just have to show them to him so that we can become his assistant. And there we go. That is all of the requirements. Uh, Firefly from Forest Haven, the three pictures. And there is the deluxe pick box. I'm gonna take a picture of Linda and we're gonna use that later to set up a date with Anton, which is another side quest. And now we're gonna catch the fourth kid. If you wonder why I didn't complete this fourth kid, despite me having some waiting time with the other two NPCs, it's because if you actually complete the quest, you get a small void out. You're gonna see right here of it like teleporting me. And this would have reset the other NPC cycles that I was waiting for. So you do as much as you can, like I said, but you can't do quite everything. So now after I got the killer beast, I talk to the teacher, start this quest. And this is for way later in the game when we want to get the cabana deed. Once we have that, we are now going to basically enter the upstairs area to the shop. So we're going to do this fly over here and we're gonna get these two chests then we're gonna go through the crawl space that's coming up ahead fall down we're gonna take a picture of them kind of secretly dating once you take that picture you can then walk up to two npcs that are kind of gossiping and while they're gossiping uh you show them the picture of proof of like hey these guys are dating you end up getting a treasure chart i will then show the picture to the npc that is actually secretly dating as well and she will give me a treasure chart for showing her the picture 
and then I am ready to do my next super swim. So this super swim is going to head all the way from Windfall Island down to Forest Haven because I have done a good amount of the early game side quests right now and there's not much more that I can do right now without it being really slow because it's faster to combine some of the side quests I have left here for later. So by going to Forest Haven, I can finally do the second dungeon of the game. I'm gonna walk into the beetle boat. And here we're going to buy the spoils bag, some Swedish meatballs, and a pear. And these spoils are actually necessary to 100% the game. So you can skip most of them, but you do have to get one set of each. Uh, once I have left this beetle boat now, we're going to jump in. And I have to do this pretty quickly to get on a cycle. So I just barely have enough magic to be able to do this, thankfully. So... What I'm going to do is I'm going to go right here and then I'm going to stop my boat with the Tingle Tuner or the Wind Waker, sorry, and I'm going to wait. And then right as I'm about to be picked up by this Wirelwind, I'm going to jump out of my boat and then take out my leaf. It will be picking me up. I will fly straight towards Forest Haven or Forbidden Woods, sorry. And I will just barely make it there without having to go through the inside of Forest Haven to get high up enough. And we are now in the dungeon. This dungeon, in my opinion, is a good way to represent why the combination of glitches and the Game Boy Advance is so powerful. We're gonna enter the first room here, leaf across. And you can see, by the way, that I'm flying on these edges. And if you ever play this game casually, you might be shocked that I'm able to grab these ledges, by the way. I should clarify that every time I'm using the leaf, I'm actually having to do a trick. So first, you cannot grab a ledge out of your leaf. So anytime I grab a ledge out of my leaf, I am perfectly pressing A to cancel my leaf to take it away. Because the leaf is out, you can't grab a ledge. I'm also doing a trick known as a leaf pump to maintain my height. Basically, every time you take out your leaf, you get a tiny increase of height. Just like a little hoop, and then you slowly fall back down. But by pressing A and then to take away the leaf and then the leaf button a split second later, you basically just cancel and retake out your leaf over and over again, which continuously gives you height, which lets you technically, if you do perfectly, maintain it. And that is used all the way throughout this. Uh, the only negative is that if you miss time it, you just fall down because I'm literally canceling my leaf. And it also takes a lot of extra magic. Thankfully, that's not a problem because here's 50 secret rupees. Because not only is Tingle useful for things such as buying things, but there's also secret hidden rupees all the way throughout the game that you can discover with Tingle Bombs. And that was one of them. So I was able to get some more money. And then right here, now you can see the power of <laughs> the completely broken mechanic that is chest storage. However, there is more than just chest storage shenanigans right here. One of the main items that is featured on the Game Boy Advanced Tingle Tuner that I haven't talked about yet is an item called a Tingle Balloon. While the Tingle Balloon basically functions like the hover boots in Ocarina of Time. So I'm going to use storage to walk up on this ledge and then just walk off. And for five seconds, I can walk in the air thanks to my Tingle Balloon. And that lets me run across the air from the glitched height I just got with my chest storage and then just run into this room. So and I just skipped half the dungeon. And I have already made it to the mini boss room of this dungeon. I'm gonna wait in this corner and as he's about to come here, I'm gonna blow to stun him. And then if I do this perfectly, he should get stun locked in this corner. So my quick spin actually hits him twice each time, which normally shouldn't happen because of the knockback. So he just instantly dies. And then right here, I'm going to get chest storage. Uh, but here, it's not actually for skipping anything. It's just because I can not solve the puzzle to leave the room. So it skips having to watch the animation or receiving the item and that tiny, tiny puzzle. So it saves like 10 seconds or so. But if you're really comfortable with chest storage, you can kind of just do that throughout. Uh, and right here is another really cool trick. I'm going to aim up with my grappling hook at a very precise spot and then have this exact movement. And then I make sure that the straight path back to me from the boomerang happens to align with that chest. 
So the eye on top of that chest gets exploded without me having to actually go through the whole puzzle of solving this. And then right here, I'm gonna do the similar thing I did earlier. I'm going to try to get storage. Uh, and this time it is because it's really slow to leave this room once I obtain this item. There we go. I can get storage. And then what I'm gonna try and do by looking at the map while it's invisible is get crushed by this hole here that I'm supposed to go out of. And it voids me out and puts me back at the door. So I don't have to do what I normally would have to to leave this area, but it's just a quick way to get out. And uh, we are now officially done with the dungeon. That's literally it. That's every single bonus treasure chart that the game has. And it is every item that this dungeon has. So I'm completely done. The only thing that I'm technically missing at this point is the boss key. Thankfully, that is also not an issue. And then right here, very conveniently, another chest will spawn. And meaning that we can get chest storage a final time in this dungeon. And then the last thing I need to make sure that I pick up in this dungeon before I leave is a little fairy. So I'm going to change my equips. I'm going to do this because it likes to instantly fly into you sometimes. Pick up the fairy in the bottle. This will be used for later. And now, because we have the small storage glitch, we don't have the boss key. We can just walk right through that little gap. Because thankfully, the developers left a tiny few pixels of space in between the door and the wall. And since Link's hitbox is so tiny from chest storage, we can just walk right through it. When you store a chest, the item is given to you either once you leave an area so it unloads or once you void out. Okay. Let's hope I can get this one cycle. Okay, clean. On the, on the HD version, it's a very easy one cycle to do, but on GameCube, it is very tight because your weapons are slightly weaker than a jump slash. Uh, but yeah, that's the dungeon. Uh, at this point, we can just pick up the heart container and we'll leave and we'll get the beautiful Dekadru cutscene. Now, once I'm done with this dungeon, I'm going to have to pick up a lot of just random things throughout the overworld. So right here is a kind of a straightforward section. So I'm basically going to super swim two coordinates north to place the forest pearl I just obtained from this dungeon. Then after I place that, I'm gonna do another identical super swim, uh, but west this time to place the dense pearl. Uh, once I've placed both of them, I'm going to do one last super swim. And this one is going to be all the way down north of um, outside Island to enter Isle of Steel. And this is when I'm going to get my first kind of end game item, which is going to be a Triforce chart. Got it. Perfect. Okay. That's a very tight super swim to make. It's like almost the max length in which you can super swim from. So you want to make sure that you're really careful on that. Uh, you're going to see another cool thing, by the way, here uh, after spawning this chest. Here's another example of getting crushed. So I'm going to store opening up this chest, then run up against the wall. It will crush Link. You can hear him go, goo, 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 goo. And it's once again, just to save a little bit of time because that just lets me super quickly like this, leave and not have to worry about anything else. And then once I've done that, this is the first sailing section that you will ever see. I'm going to sail to Greatfish because it's super close and uh, it's just kind of a part of the route. So I will actually have one sailing section in the run. Uh, but yeah, there's nothing to explain really here. Once I get to Greatfish, I need to go here to activate an event called Endless Night because that's what spawns uh, the third pearl into the overworld. And uh, there's just like a long cutscene here of like talking to the Rito and talking about what happened to this destroyed island. Also, after this cutscene is now completed, you're going to see me start the slow, tedious quest. If you ever try to 100% win Baker yourself, you know about this quest very well. This is the flower trading quest. You basically go to a bunch of Gorons around the overworld and just trade flowers with them to eventually get to the highest one. And then you can trade that for a heart piece. So I'm going to have to do some trading with the flowers. Thankfully, the route does take everything into consideration, so I don't have to do anything on the fly, but this is the first two flowers. And we want to do that as early as possible because if you just trade two of them, you will get the magic armor. To optimize the magic armor routing, uh, we do it now. But yeah, after I traded that, I have to do a special super swim here called a double storage. So basically, I get storage and then I super swim while a text box was completed on my screen 
And the reason that's so important is because that means that I can skip something while super swimming at the same time, which might sound really confusing and like doesn't sound like it would hold any purpose. But the reason for that is because the game will attempt to play a cutscene as I reach outside island. If I am in the super swim glitch, when that cutscene gets activated, my game would soft lock. So the run would be completely dead. So I have to make sure that I not only can super swim, but I can also cutscene skip. So you can see right here, bam, right there, the King of Red Lions just spawned and I randomly splooshed in place here. That was the cutscene being skipped. Then once I'm here, we are going to do three things. The first, the first thing is to take a picture of the full moon. The second one we're gonna have to come back to because I'm supposed to get grandma soup right here but I accidentally used up the ferry and there's no quick ferry. So I'm gonna have to do a small reroute here for that, unfortunately. So sorry, grandma, but you're gonna have to stay a little bit sick. But yeah, and the other thing we're gonna do here is do a quick little out of bounds clip. So I'm going to use this bomb to push me out of bounds and then use that to basically swim into uh, the loading zone for where the Nyrus Pearl is located. You can see, though, the cutscene doesn't spawn here, by the way. Like, you actually have to break the wall um, to spawn the cutscene where you get the last third pearl. Thankfully, you can, though, skip the whirlwind by going barely into this corner right here without activating it. And then sniping the bombs from this corner. There is the third pearl. That is all three pearls we need to access Tower of the Gods, which is like the midway point. So yeah, after having that, I'm now going to basically do what I did earlier. I'm just immediately going to go to the front of Outside Island by sailing with my boat. Going to get storage, do a quick super swim, go all the way across the ocean over to the island where you place the third and final pearl. And once I've done that, you will just start the long cutscene of Tower of the Gods. Watch it, sploosh your head into the wall of Tower of the Gods, and we are then ready to enter the dungeon. We're going to sail into Tower of the Gods, and we're now ready to go on to the third dungeon of the run. And this dungeon is one of the more straightforward ones. There are a couple of really cool glitches and skips that you're going to see. It's sort of almost like an auto-scroller, only because you have to get each individual statue, and you have to follow a mandated path. At least it has some cool stuff. So the first thing I'm going to do is clip out of bounds by using that bomb, going against the bomb, and the, port, the push of the bomb will clip me through the wall. Then thanks to having the Deku Leaf, I can leaf out of bounds and enter this corridor. And this already skipped half of the dungeon. And then I can just kind of step on these three switches and activate the elevators and head over to the second floor. And if you don't know how this dungeon is built up, by the way, the first one is, the first floor is like guiding you of how to use the mechanics of the statues. The second floor is to activate this portal and the third floor is just a boss. Here, I'm going to use Tingle again as well. By using a Tingle bomb right there, there's a secret hidden 50 rupee that he's placed. There is a lot more that I'm not getting in this run that are like out of the way, but any Tingle rupees that happen to just be like on my path, I get either way. Uh, also, here is a really easy glitch. Unlike most glitches that I've done that are really difficult, this is an actual easy glitch I'm about to perform that even you could do at home, 100%. So, Basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call for the statue and then just crawl. And then I'm going to hold R and as I release it, I press A. And you just pick him up right through the floor, skipping this whole puzzle. So if you stand on that platform, you're too far away from the statue to properly pick him up. Um, and if you crawl, you're technically within the pickup radius, but you can't pick something up while you're crawling. But a small oversight for Nintendo is when you let go of the R button to stop crawling, as he is standing up, you can pick something up during that entire animation. But since Link model hasn't stood up yet, so you know he slowly stands back up, it means that if you press A within the first, like, I don't know, half a second or whatever, it's a pretty generous window. He just picks him up through the floor and it doesn't check for the collision. Here, I am supposed to use this song that I just obtained to control the statue to walk over a bridge that I just built. But there's actually a skip you can do called bridge skip. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this setup where I kind of uh, sidled against the statue, turned around and did a jump slash. And now I've perfectly set up my position so that if I pick up the statue, I will have a perfect angle. From there, if I do this correctly with perfect side hops, all I have to do is get into this corner, 
do four precise side hops and I just barely get around the pillar without falling down. It's, it looks super easy and it is not too difficult with that setup, but it is an insanely precise trick. And before we had a setup for it, it was a not run killer, but a big time loss most of the time. And now once I am in this mini boss room, there is actually another really cool trick that we can do right here. And it's kind of exploiting how the game handles health bars. So for enemies that have armors, there's only one health bar that the game assigns to it. And once you break the armor, it resets that health bar. But if you look, I hit him with two slashes and he died. It's because what I did is I, sl I, I spin attacked him three times, which is a huge amount of damage to the armor. And then instead of breaking it, I knocked it off of him. And because he got knocked off and wasn't broken off, it never reset the health bar, meaning that he only had two hits away from dying. And you can do that with any knights in the game. Two out of three statues, one more to go. We do have an extra stop or two here before we can do the last one, because since this is 100%, there actually is a few hidden treasure charts in this dungeon. One of them are here. So I'm gonna take out a bomb and hopefully not mistime it. There we go. <laughs> Explode the wall to get access to the secret room and then uh, use Wind's Requiem and this will spawn the chest which will contain one of the um, treasure charts. Right here, you're supposed to kind of go around these platforms, use a bunch of arrows to move them. But if you know the pattern, which happens to just be so lucky as literally go immediately once you enter the room and leave to the left, you catch that cycle without having to move any of the other platforms. So you immediately get the small key and there's nothing else of value in this room. So you can just void out on purpose, get put back here and then you can just kind of continue forward. Uh, there's also a few tricks you can do to like speed up these elevators. So going into this room, I only have to throw one to raise this. And then by just landing on the corner and then immediately jumping off, it doesn't have time to go down. So I can just barely make that second jump and um, not have to worry about putting two statues on it. Uh, and right here, I'm going to leaf around the statue um, normally you use like command melody to like walk him through and do a bunch of slow stuff, but to not have to play a bunch of additional songs, you can just kind of leaf above and he will follow you because you were so close once you activated him. And then here is the last exploit for a long time with the use of Tingle Tuner. So I'm going to use the Tingle Balloon to walk across this room and skip the puzzle entirely. And one thing you might be asking yourself is, how did Nintendo not foresee how broken the Tingle Tuner would be to beat these puzzles? They actually were, we just outsmarted them. So if you try right now to boot up your game and use the Tingle Tuner in that room, it will not work. Nintendo actually thought, wait, it might be a bad idea if the player can use the Tingle Balloon and other items from Tingle when they're in a puzzle room. So it's actually disabled. However, this is where they got outsmarted. What you can do is activate the Tingle Balloon in front of the door, the room before the elevators, and then the second it kicks on, you immediately open the door. And it's just barely long enough to be able to be used to walk across the platforms. Right here, because I accidentally used one of my fairies, I do have to get an additional backup fairy here. So I'm going to break these pots right here. Pick up that fairy. And then to make sure I don't accidentally use it, I'm going to unequip the fairy. I am not risking accidentally using one again. When it comes to this boss right here, if you play perfectly and time your arrows, you can barely squeeze out a one cycle right there. Uh, but you can have movement to manipulate him to stay in the corner, but it's still somewhat luck-based because certain directions will still screw you over. So hopefully if we play well here, we should get either one cycles or two cycles. So like right there, for example, it barely missed. Now let's take him down with the last arrow. And that is the third boss taken care of, and Tower of the Gods. Now, this is when the route starts to get very strange and complicated, and we're gonna break 
all of the intended order. Once we have watched this cutscene, we're going to have the heart piece spawn. We're gonna side hop into it to pick it up. And then I'm going to save and quit my game. I do not want to actually stay here. So we're just gonna save and quit. So normally, this portal takes you down to Hyrule 1, which is where you get the Master Sword. And it is mandatory in a casual playthrough to do that. However, there are a lot of cutscenes. I'm going to say a lot of cutscenes. I mean a lot of cutscenes in Hyrule 1. It is like three minute cutscene, one minute cutscene, two minute cutscene, cutscene, cutscene. It's like seven, eight minutes straight of cutscenes. It's really awful. Even if you can get to Forsaken Fortress too early, you cannot actually fight Phantom Ganon without the Master Sword. So it is required. Um... Thankfully, though, speedrunners have found ways around the sequences of the mid part of this game now. So we have been able to cut out a lot of the cutscenes that older runs used to have if you watched old runs. So I'm going to get the last treasure chart in Tower of the Gods. That was the last one that they have. And then after all of that, we are just going to leave the dungeon. And then we're going to go ahead and sail over to Cyclos. And this is the... The Cyclos is all around the overworld. You have seen him throughout the whole game. If you ever played this game, you've definitely seen him. Uh, in the beginning of the game, he just kind of teleports you somewhere random and you can't fight him. But once you have the bow and arrow, you can not take him down. And he is the one that teaches you the actual song to teleport, which is very useful for a speedrun. Also, since I have extra arrows, I can just kind of shoot beforehand to try and make it so that there's no weight in between the hits. Uh, after I have gotten the song now, I'm going to go over to this Triangle Island, get storage, and I'm going to use it to super swim up to Crescent Moon. Because um, right here, there is a submarine that's kind of just out of the way, so there's not a really good time to go for it. So we kind of just route it in right here. And it will have a necessary item inside of the... Oh my god, that is a sick angle, okay. Anyways, once I've now gotten this submarine... I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to open up some treasure charts and I'm going to sail to Crescent Moon and salvage it. Now you're going to notice throughout the speedrun as a whole that the boat is only used basically exclusively when we're at an island where we need to actually salvage a treasure. Uh, and that's also why we often uh, route in these submarines right here because the submarines are used a convenient way to spawn the boat even though you super swam because if you go to an island you know with a super swim you know the boat's obviously not going to be there. Right here, I'm going to have to do another storage. Uh, this is going to be used for both super swimming, but I also have to do it because I have to have chest storage for the next skip coming up. So I'm going to do a new storage you haven't seen, where I'm basically going to super swim with the chest storage enabled. So right now, I just got chest storage and... I'm in my Wind Waker state, so I can super swim. So we're going to head over to Windfall because I want to head all the way to Forsaken Fortress 2, but it's too far of a super swim. But because of storage, by just hitting that wall right there, it actually gives me an air refill. So now while I'm at Forsaken Fortress, you're going to notice how broken chest storage can be because a lot of these boulders and a lot of this collision was not intended to be used with the small collision. So I can kind of just climb everything. And this is why I don't need to have the Master Sword already. Because I don't have to fight Phantom Ganon yet. We can do it later by just completely climbing up every single wall here. And then just like entering the loading zone for the boss. Now once the fight has started, uh, we're going to run up this entire tower. There is no reason to fight any of these enemies whatsoever. They hold no purpose whatsoever. And then thankfully, we can also actually skip this boss fight. So this boss fight is unbeatable right now. Because since I did not complete Phantom Ganon yet, and he gives you the Skull Hammer, I have no form of damage to take down this big bird. But you can get around him into this upper arena. And once you get here, you can do a setup right here like this. And by doing this setup right here, I can climb partially inside of the ledge, do a frame perfect roll clip, clip underneath the stage, and then jump up behind the spikes, and then run straight into the loading zone for the next Ganon cutscene. So, right there, that's it. 
That's the entire fight. This is another part where you're, I'm just going to skip a ton of content for YouTube. I would say you're welcome for this. TLDR, okay? Long Ganon cutscene. Ganon bad. Oh no, we can't fight him. Master Sword not strong enough. Dragon comes, burns up the lair. Go to Tower of the Gods, talk to Bowden Dragon. We go down to Hyrule. We enter a chamber where we find out, oh no, oh my goodness. Tetra is Zelda this whole time. Super sick. And then we leave the chamber, okay? This ends up being like 10 minutes of cutscene straight. There is nothing you need to see there. But then after we're done with that, we're coming up on some really big glitches. So I'll skip forward to that. So we're finally past all of the cutscenes. Coming up right here is a massive sequence break called Barrier Skip. You might have seen it before. I'm not sure if you've seen this setup I'm about to do. It's a newer setup, and it's much faster than the old one. So the old methods used to involve basically a glitch called memory corruption. But nowadays, we use a bomb. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this very precise setup right here to get into a uh, float value perfect position. Okay. Then once I'm here, I'm going to do a very careful left turn. And I'm hopefully at the correct position. Then once I'm in add, I'm going to pause buffer turning around. So I'm going to do one spin. And then two spins. Once I am here, hopefully if I did it correctly. By frame perfectly placing a bomb. Bam. We just get right through the barrier. So by being perfectly in the middle right there, there is a one pixel gap in between the two invisible walls where they meet up because it's not a perfect cylinder. And if you place that bomb frame perfectly at the perfect position, then the bomb's force, because when you drop a bomb, I'll show you right now, it pushes you forward like that. But you can see sometimes it's forward, sometimes it's a little bit left. That's why it's frame perfect. If you drop it on the correct frame, you will get pushed like a forward right angle to perfectly hit that one pixel of missing collision. It clips you through the barrier, and once that is skipped, I can now go straight to the end game. And if this was on any percent run, I would currently try and go and beat the game right now. However, since it's 100%, I don't plan to beat the game yet, but this still saves an incredible amount of time. Now, once I am inside of Ganon's tower right here, I immediately come into an issue, which is that here's the trials, and I cannot complete the trials. Like, I literally just cannot complete the trials. I don't have any of the items required. You're supposed to, you know, go through all the dungeons, right? Each one uses the dungeon item. Thankfully, just like how everything else works in Wind Waker, there is always a skip for everything. Right here, I'm going to do a very precise clip. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a bomb to partially clip me out of bounds, but not completely. Then I have to climb up and perform a second frame perfect trick, which is a, the roll clip. And by doing that, I will clip out of bounds but still have the height of the ledge. And that is very important. I fly all the way into the loading zone, completely skipping all of the trials. And now I have full access to Ganon's tower. It's 100%, so I can't just go and beat the game. But there's still multiple reasons we would like to go here early. So first of all, by going here early, I can open up this shortcut here. And this shortcut takes me directly to Forsaken Fortress. Meaning I never have to go through all the cutscenes that the game would normally play for me to enter Hyrule 3, like the end of the game. Because that means once I've 100%ed it, I can just use this portal to take me to the end of the game. So that saves minutes alone in cutscenes. The second reason it's so useful to come here is because this tower has the light arrows. And if you've ever played Wind Waker, you will know that the light arrows is the most busted item out of any Zelda game ever. You can just literally one hit everything. Also, if you're wondering here why I'm not killing Phantom Ganon, the order here is always the same. It's always down, left, up, left, right, up. You can just memorize the order. Uh, I will do one quick detour on purpose here because one room right here, this room, where you can get additional rupees. I'm basically skipping through the whole thing, but I will do one quick stop here just to get those rupees. Like I mentioned, light arrows are very useful because you can one hit every enemy, but there's a second reason it's so useful. This game kind of functions as like a progressive based item upgrade where this is the basically bow and arrow version three. One is just standard bow and arrow, two is fire and ice arrows, and three is fire, ice, light arrows. 
So by getting the light arrows right now, we also just got the fire and ice arrows. Meaning that I just skipped having to watch a three minute cutscene of obtaining the fire and ice arrows. So I'm going up here, I'm going to uh, get some of the spoils from these enemies, which I need for trading later. So I'm gonna get this guy. Here's the third and final reason for going to this area early. This is the last one. If you look at my equipment right now, I had an unupgraded Master Sword and the Hero Shield. When I enter this room, I have a fully charged Master Sword and the Mirror Shield instead of the Hero's Shield. And that is because cutscenes in this game are incredible. So whenever you're using an item in a cutscene, the game just has a hard-coded code, like basically code of, hey, give the player this item and use it. And normally you would never notice that because you would already have the mirror shield here, for example. So by replacing your mirror shield with an identical mirror shield, it doesn't change anything, right? But in our use case, because I didn't have it to begin with, I just got a mirror shield and a fully charged master sword for free. Meaning that now I am able to do a ton of more stuff around the overworld and my routing abilities just opened up wild. An example being Earth Temple, right? When I get to Earth Temple, normally you'd have to be really slow for the first half and you're really restricted until you get the Mirror Shield. But we already have it, meaning that when we enter the Earth Temple, we can immediately start doing puzzles. We don't have to wait for, you know, getting medley or getting anything like that. Um, and for the Fully Charged Master Sword, it also skips a lot of the cutscenes because I already have the, the sword that it wants to upgrade me to. Okay, and then once I'm here, I'm going to equip my Wind Waker and save and quit out of here. And now here is another convenient thing. I just finally obtained my Master Sword, meaning I can finally now take on fighting Phantom Ganon. Flip, we get some good RNG here. Phantom Ganon is very RNG based, so he can spawn in midair or on the ground. Each time he spawns in the air, I lose like about 10 seconds. Okay, that's two out of three. Really good RNG so far. One more. Oh, never mind. I two cycled him. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes if you immediately attack him when he spawns on the ground, you can get what's known as like a double hit, so you can two cycle him like that. But I was not expecting it, but very nice. Okay, anyways, that's the boss down. Now uh, we're coming up on one of the more risky parts of the game. So this is a glitch coming up right here, which if I fail, my game will just straight up crash. First things first, is I have to get storage, go down here, and then get chest storage up here. Now you might be like, okay, this seems pretty simple. I get what you're trying to do here. So you're gonna try and get chest storage, run up to the top, you know, clip into the loading zone for how much you did it earlier, and then it's done. And you're not technically wrong. That is what I want to do but there's more to it. When you enter Helmrock's lair, right, where Helmrock is located, a cutscene will play. And I've already watched that cutscene. You know, that's when Tetra comes in and you know, you're know you with your sister. And because I've watched it one time, if I just normally enter that loading zone, my game will crash. So I have to find a way into that loading zone without activating a cutscene. But that's kind of difficult because the, like the lo like the cutscene starts the second the loading zone takes place. So I have to do a couple of things. First things first, I have to do the storage right here, which is really difficult because I already have chest storage enabled. So my collision is weird. So it changes the timing. We're going to go on top of the door frame, not enter the loading zone. If I enter the loading zone right now, my game is gonna crash. So be careful to not enter the loading zone and land on top of this door frame. Walk on it out of bounds, line myself up straight, and then go to the very corner of this door. Then I'm gonna aim in with my bow and aim right here for this island. And then what I'm gonna try and do is I'm gonna try and slash my sword to take on my leaf at the exact same time. And if it worked, got it. You heard me get crushed, but the screen voiding out to white. So what all of that crazy setup does is it allows you to get crushed on the same frame that you enter a loading zone. So because the top of that loading zone is kind of angled, with chest storage, you can be considered crushed because you're inside of an object. It's kind of strange, but that's just how the game works. So I try and make it so that I get crushed in the same frame enter the loading zone. And if both of those actions take place in the same frame, then I will just like get past it and I don't have to worry about the fight at all. 
Um, if I enter the loading zone a frame early, so the crush took place on the wrong frame, my game crashes and my run is dead. So it might have looked really simple, but it's a very precise glitch and it's very scary for the run to do. And then right here for the second phase of this boss fight, I have a really cool skip here. So you can see that I just jumped down into the tower while the cutscene is happening. I get storage again. You're probably picking up on it at this point. Storage breaks everything. But in this case, I it only thing it does is not skip it. It's just that it lets me walk while the cutscene is playing. And that meant that I could jump back into the tower when the second phase is playing out. And normally, if I look up here, you can see it's closed off. You're normally never supposed to be able to be inside of this arena for phase two. But I am. Why do we want to be here? Well, because Helmrock can't walk up to us properly when we're on top of a ginormous obstacle. So that means that we can just slash him four times and then quick spin. Quick spin, quick spin, quick spin, and dead. And that's it. It just completely eliminates the boss fight, and it's really fast. And as a speedrunner, this skip is a god blessing. Because not only is it faster, but it removes RNG. Because Helmrock's attacks are all luck-based, meaning that if you're fighting him at the top, you only have a 1 in 3 chance that he does a peck attack, which is the one where you can actually hit him with a skull hammer. So it's not only faster, but it also removes a ton of RNG from the sequence. But yeah, after doing this, I can now finally get the heart container. So now I got I got the skull hammer, I got the heart container, and we're good. But we're kind of stuck here. If I enter this, the cutscene doesn't play anymore. It's just a broken cutscene room. Well, thankfully, once again, Wind Waker being broken helps us again. So if I save and quit in that room. The game doesn't know where to put me because he never thought you could save in a cutscene room. So it defaults us to the default spawn location in the game, which happens to be Windfall Island. And we are now back into the overworld and we can do anything we want and we don't have to worry about anything. And now once we're over at Windfall, uh, we're going to start doing some side quests again. This is probably the worst section of the run if you're going for old record attempts, because this is the number one RNG element of the run. Um, I'm not gonna play through in full speed every auction here, so I'll just summarize how the auction house works. So there's four items on the GameCube version, two treasure charts, one heart piece, and one joy pendant. Bidding for the auction takes so long that if you get an item you don't want, you just have to say no, leave, and re-enter and retry. Every item has an equal amount of chance of appearing, meaning that right now, there was a 25% chance to get that heart piece, a 50% chance to get one of the two heart pieces, and a 25% chance at the Joy Pendant. Every time you get a Joy Pendant, you lose 45 seconds having to leave and re-enter. But since you're never buying it, you're just saying no to it, it stays in the pool. Meaning that you basically have a 25% chance, then a 33% chance, and then a 50% chance to get the Joy Pendant, in theory, an infinite amount of times. The most amount of time I've ever lost here is about eight minutes. Um, but it's insanely unlucky. In average, I think it's like two joy pendants you will get. Obviously, you can get zero if you're lucky. With two joy pendants, that means you lose a minute and a half. You might also be surprised about how I'm playing the auction, by the way. To get through the auction quickly, we just continuously bid 10% above the current bid, which stuns them for a random amount of time in between 10 to 15 seconds. And that makes it so that it's not as expensive to play this game. And it also means that it's faster because they're not interrupting the timer by wanting to bid. What is the second item going to be? Are we going to get a Mappa or a Joy Pendant? Joy Pendant. Nice. Thank you for the demonstration. Yeah, so that's what we don't want. So if that happens, we have to say, no, we don't want it. We leave and we go back in and try again. So much joy. So now once I have gotten everything from the auction, I'm going to do a couple of random windfall stuff. So I'm going to jump on top of this thing just barely for the cycle to make it. And then I'm going to shoot a fire arrow into the lighthouse to get a heart piece. And I'm also going to mail a letter I just received. Uh, and also a little tech tip if you ever play this game again. You don't actually have to try and hit the hole. If you just shoot the side, it lights it. You don't have to try and hit the hole. It actually is harder. So just shoot the side with like two or three light arrows. And I promise you, if you're shooting like the center, one of them will light it up and you can just completely skip past it. 
Then right here, I'm going to store that door right there. I'm going to jump down. I'm going to deliver this letter. And then here, I can kind of just chill. Um, I'm having to wait on a cycle right there because, you know, the girl's running around all of Windfall and then eventually she'll try and sneak up to steal a bottle and that's when I kind of catch her. And now here's a small little clever route. So if you're watching earlier in the run, you remember how I did like kind of a wrong warp slash teleportation to get back to the pirate ship from Forsaken Fortress 1 by, you know, like storing that door to get bombs early. I'm gonna use the same one again um, to just save literally 10 seconds, but it's just such cool routing. So since we had to wait for anyways, I got storage and stored a door to the rich people's house, which is where, or Maggie's house, which is where I need to go right now. So instead, I'm just gonna open up this door, which is much closer than where I currently was, teleports me to the rich house, and now I get this cutscene. And I need this cutscene to activate because uh, this will make him go to the cafe, which will be used later for obtaining a heart piece for Maggie. So now we're going to leave Windfall. And like I said, the kind of goal right now will basically just be to um, complete a couple of things like on the way before Earth Temple. I usually just call this the pre-Earth Temple segment. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to head over to Wind Temple and just learn the song. I don't have the Iron Boots yet, so I normally shouldn't be able to access this building yet. But what you can do is you can take out the Wind Waker and it will reset Link sliding backwards from the wind. Because usually you can walk against a strong wind for about half a second and then you start sliding backwards. So by just taking it back out and in, you can get close enough and then break it with the Skull Hammer. And I can go in here and we can get the next song. Now we're going to go and get the Power Bracelets, which is necessary for completing the Earth Temple. So I'm going to go up on top of this ledge, I'm gonna get storage, and then we're going to go through here, jump into the water, and then super swim. Now, this island specifically, um, you can't actually enter normally by just super swimming because, you know, it's a volcano. So I'm going to do one thing that I haven't done yet in the run that will be used occasionally for these kind of special occasion islands throughout 100% run which is to purposely drown, which sounds very strange, but it's just helpful. So by being against an island as you drown, on certain locations, not all of them, you will just kind of respawn on the island. But in this case, on the Fire Mountain, since there's no on it, the flag is right next to it on the boat. So that means I can just kind of shoot it and immediately enter it and skip all of it. We super quickly just run through uh, Fire Mountain, take down the enemies. The last two enemies actually spawn the chest. Pick it up, that gives us the power bracelets. And then once we have obtained the power bracelets, we can kind of just like lift up this giant stone right here and make our way out of it. Now, I would like to make it all the way to the, like the bottom of the map where Earth Temple is located, but because of the distance, there's no way I can. So we're gonna do one quick stop, but it's not gonna be a time loss stop where it's like, oh, just stop wherever to get some air. Instead, very clever routing this is. There are two stops that we make. The first one is Bird's Peak, which if you know anything about Bird's Peak, this is actually one of the locations that has a Triforce chart, so it's a needed anyways. And second of all, I don't need anything special to enter this island because this island is broken. All you have to do is just grapple this, and then we just have to press 8 at the correct time, and we clip through, and we're in. Could you get infinite rupees here? So there are a lot of rupees here on the international releases. This is something I haven't mentioned yet, but it's very noticeable once we get to end game. The north of like the, the, the international releases in HD version would have a bunch of rupee pots in these sort of areas. Not on Japanese. On Japanese, there's like no rupees anywhere. Like it's basically nowhere. For a Japanese player, if you don't know glitches, the only way you can get rupees is by just re-going through the first 30 floors of Savage Labyrinth. Like, I'm not kidding you, that would probably be your best strat. Without glitches, it's just go through Savage like five times in a row. There is just no rupees around that just gives you a good amount of rupees as you're playing. You have to go out of your way to grind for it. It's really bad. As a speedrunner, we have some glitches to get them faster later, but yeah still not a good time okay after we are done with this island we're gonna do another super swim and this one is another precise one and like i said we're kind of trying to make it over to earth temple right now by not and not losing time by having to do stops and this is the second stop we're gonna make 
So we're gonna actually fall here on purpose to make sure I'm not gonna like accidentally drown. And then we're going to go ahead and s swim over towards ice ring. There it is. And then right here, if you climb up, you will freeze and it will respawn us back in King of Red Lions. And now we have access to the island. Okay. <laughs> Cool. All right. That's uh, that's one hell of an explosion. All right. Sure. And here we can also do one other cool skip. So what we should be able to do here is perfectly time a roll and barely get through. So you're supposed to go around a puzzle here. But if you roll right before you enter that wind, you can just barely go against the wind. And as it starts pushing you away, you're already on the other side. So you can just immediately get the iron boots without having to solve any puzzles or anything like that. I'm going to super some down to the reef, which is the coordinate next to Earth Temple. I'm going to save and quit once I get on top of the shore. And then I'm going to sail north to start a octo fight. This octo can technically be obtained later, but it's specifically chosen to be in the route right before going to Earth Temple. Because Earth Temple uses a ton of magic. And this is the most useful Octo to take down because unlike the other ones who either gives you rupees or maybe a heart piece or something, which I mean, isn't really necessary for us. This specific Octo actually rewards you with double magic. And not only double magic, but it completely refills your magic bar as well. So we will now have a double magic and a full bar, uh, which is gonna be very useful for Earth Temple. But there's one more thing that you might be thinking about right now. You keep talking about going to Earth Temple, but I'm looking at that boat, Linkus. There is no medley there. And that is because with some more recent discoveries, in 100%, medley is no longer required. We do an incredibly difficult route called medleyless Earth Temple. So medley is no longer obtained or used in any regard in this speedrun. And what we're coming up on is not only a very difficult Earth Temple, but we are also coming up on the most precise glitch in the run. It is more precise to, to complete than even barrier skip is. This skip is more precise than any of them. But the first thing we have to do before we start actually trying to use glitches to get into Earth Temple early and get through it is um, we have to obtain the Song Song because... It's part of 100%. So now after obtaining the Earth Temple song, we are going to try and enter Earth Temple, but there's an issue. We haven't got a medley like I said earlier. So we have to do a glitch to get in. And this is, like I said, more precise than barrier skip. So first I have to get a float value perfect position to have a chance to clip out of bounds. So this is the setup. So turn around, do a neutral roll, then slash, right slash, right slash. And all of those have to be frame perfect. Now I have to do the same thing again, but with a hold B on my third input. So slash, right, right, spin. Then do a neutral B and shield. Take it away, tap down, do a one frame sidle, one frame sidle, turn around, neutral roll, perfectly change your position to a perfect right without walking, then do one crawl for one frame, roll, see up, turn around, see up, look up, and then spin around exactly two times. So one, two, and then I have to stop spinning on that frame right there. Now I have the correct position and I have the correct angle. And you can actually see on my shadow that it's kind of like a little bit darker by my left foot. That is because I am one pixel off of the loading zone. Meaning if I go one pixel to the left, I enter the loading zone. And the objective here is to have a bomb push me in between where the loading zone is and where this wall meets up. And if I do it, then I can clip out of bounds, but it is frame perfect. So this is what we're gonna do. I'm gonna take out a bomb and I'm gonna pause buffer until this frame. Now what I have to do, hopefully I can get it. I have two attempts to do this. I have to unpause on the first frame the game unpauses, press B to drop the bomb and then immediately pause again on the next frame. I got it. Now I have to do the perfect leaf section. And you can see it's really tight. I might not make it. Oh, okay. Just barely got it. And that's it. 
That's how you get into Earth Temple. All those leaf pumps and that entire setup is ridiculously precise. But if you do all of that perfectly, you can just barely get into Earth Temple early. It is the most precise glitch in the entire game. It might have looked easy, but trust me, that glitch alone is one of the most time-consuming glitches to learn. But we're not over with our problems yet. You can just hear my Game Boy just turned on. And that is because this dungeon is not over in terms of difficulty. Because I don't have medley. And that is a big problem to just do Earth Temple in general, but especially to do it 100%. So now we're going to the first room. We have our first issue. So we, because we don't have medley, we're supposed to put medley on that one and link on this one, but I cannot do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this Moblin instead. So I'm going to grapple him and try and lure him up here. And then I'm going to initiate purchasing a Tingle Balloon. And then I'm going to shoot him with an Ice Arrow, quickly pick him up, and then right as my Tingle Bloom starts, I walk. Then I have to very precisely throw him, side hop, jump slash to get up on the switch, re-ice him. I only have five seconds to do this, so it's super precise. Put him on the switch, and then immediately leaf here instead of flying with medley. On here, walk up, and if I time it correctly, he had not time to unfreeze it. You can see he hadn't walked off the switch yet. We get both of them on the switches, and we get to skip using medley to hit both of them. That already is very difficult, and there's a lot to it, and it's the first room. For this room, we would actually kind of be stuck here if it wasn't for barrier skip. So barrier skip is the only reason I can do this room right here. Because not only do I have light arrows, which can kill these enemies, but I also have the mirror shield, which is very important to spawn this chest. I'm going to go into this corner, and now what I would like to do is I would like to get storage. And storage and chest storage is basically necessary to get through this entire dungeon. If you would not have chest storage here, uh, you cannot get through any of it. But it's going to take a lot more than just like your average chest storage shenanigans to get through it. So first things first is I want to go to the basement. Everything that's required in 100% is located in the basement of Earth Temple. So I can skip straight to it. I am going to go up here, go into this corner right here, walk off, and then he just clips through. It's very, very good that the ledges uh, in this dungeon are aligned so that you can clip through most of them by just climbing off of it with chest storage enabled. But here's our first issue. This ledge does not work that way. This ledge, you can see if I climb up, I'll just be on, on it. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to adjust my camera just a tiny bit left. Then I'm going to have to climb up and do a frame perfect roll clip. Then I have to do a leaf pump, turn around, leaf pump, leaf pump, and... <sighs> You land by doing a jump slash on this tiny ledge behind the door, then jump slash again to uh, because you get a knockback by jump slashing the ledge to get back onto it. It is very precise. And then you can skip the song stone. I'm also pausing a little bit here to lose a little bit of time so you can get a better visual understanding of what's going on because it's a very rapid dungeon otherwise. So don't mind that I'm like standing still for a split second here and there. It's just to make it more obvious. Here I'm going to pick up a small key and I just now disabled chest storage. Then for these enemies, these enemies are very slow. So I'm going to do a combination of basically using light arrows and using my normal kind of attacks depending on how much magic I get here. Uh, this is just one of the slowest enemies to fight in the game, unfortunately. So there's not much I can do. But it is required because by defeating all of the enemies, one bonus chest will spawn in this room. And this one has a treasure chart, which is required for 100% of the game. Once I have that, I now have to get storage again and re-obtain chest storage. Getting it, side hopping, getting on top. And if you're wondering how I know where to go here, I'm basically looking at the map in the bottom of the screen to navigate since it's pitch black. But by leaving the room, I can see where I am again. And then here, you're supposed to use medley to get around here. But with some precise movement, you can just barely get up here, jump to get off here. And then you get to the top of this edge right here, which you can then use the one small key you got. Now here, I'm supposed to use medley to break this elephant statue. Thankfully, with chest storage, you can stand on this ledge right here. So I can slowly walk off and just kind of ledge clip. And it extends a little bit out of bounds. So I actually have somewhere to stand. So I'm going to do the same kind of exploit I did earlier by just barely landing on the door frame behind it. 
and that lets me open it and just get through. Then once I'm here, I can walk up on the statue, thanks to chest storage, leaf on top of this chest, turn around, slowly walk off here, and just leaf to this stone here. And if I get off on the side, bam, we get through, no problem. I do not want to jump down here yet. Oh my God, I almost messed up. Okay, <laughs> before you jump down, don't forget to explode this. Otherwise, I would have lost my progress here. So put down a bomb right there so that you have the shortcut unlocked and then jump down. After that, you're going to clip through this ledge right here, leaf backwards while out of bounds into this area right here. And now we're at the very, very bottom. And now we can basically get our next treasure chart right here. So I'm going to shine some light onto this chest, this chest, and this chest. And thankfully, because I have a light arrows, I don't even have to go down, which would, if I would have to go down, by the way, there, I'll be stuck. There's no way in chest storage state that I can actually push that block, so I would not be able to do anything. So I'm going to kill all those enemies, and then after I kill them, I'm going to actually climb up and void out on purpose. And this is so that I lose chest storage, and everything that I stored throughout this entire segment gets added into my inventory. Because if you don't, like, go through a loading zone, whatever you store in chests don't get added. So that quickly has made sure that everything I stored, all those chests, uh, which included 100% required items, got put in my inventory. We are now back into an area where we want to be, and we can get the last treasure chart, and we have officially obtained everything that we need here. Uh, now, I'm kind of stuck where I currently am. Like, I can't actually get back out. So I'm actually going to perform a save and quit right here to get put back to the start. And we can also thank Tingle, by the way. That's the end of using Tingle for help. Before I continue forward this dungeon, I do want to make sure that I actually grapple these two enemies right here. Because uh, I do need about 20 of these skulls, uh, skulls right here. Uh, and I have to train them to Maggie's dad for a treasure chart later on. And now once I've done that, I use this war pot to get back to the boss. Now, I don't have the boss key. There is still a way to skip this boss key. So what you want to do is you want to climb up on this chest, turn around to look at this little like kind of torch over there, jump off, and then do perfect leaf pumps. These has to be perfect because you can see your height is barely going to make it. Okay. Now once you're up here, you want to go into this corner, see up, and line up your B button with this texture right here. Then you just want to back walk. Okay, clip out of bounds with a frame pivot roll clip. Leaf into the loading zone. Once we're in the boss arena, there's another really cool thing I want to mention here, by the way. And this is actually a leftover from the beta version of Wind Waker. If you don't know, Wind Waker is one of like the most interesting Zelda games in terms of its development. It had so much content scrap, multiple dungeons. That's why there's so many dungeons in Twilight Princess, a lot of reused content, etc. And one of these remedies is from this boss, actually. So, the developers must have intended at some point in development for you to get light arrows earlier. Because they specifically made it so that the light arrows insta-destroys uh, this boss and makes it so you don't actually have to shine to make him light up. And he is one of the only bosses. It's not like it has like a light effect, so it's kind of just like a, an accidental thing. It is specifically programmed to have it so that this boss is affected by the light arrows. And even if you go to Ganon's Tower for like the trials, you would get the light arrows after going through the trials. So in the normal playthrough, you would never know or never even have a chance to notice that this is an effect that exists in the game. But in a speedrunner perspective, we can actually take advantage of this leftover unused mechanic. And it makes this boss fight not only faster, but also way easier. But either way, that's the boss fight. It's done in about a minute, minute and a half. And uh, that's Earth Temple for you. One of the most broken dungeons in the game. And now we're going to do something a little bit strange. You might notice that we're actually getting this cutscene right here. This cutscene is the only reason that this route works. So do you remember earlier how I mentioned that by watching a cutscene, I got the fully charged master early? Well, we have to on purpose watch this cutscene to downgrade it because the flag internal in the game to decide if Makar should spawn into the overall and then you can you know bring him to Wind Temple is based upon if your sword is at its half upgraded state, which makes sense because in a casual playthrough, it would be right after Earth Temple, which is when you want to go to Wind Temple. Once we're done with the dungeon, I'm going to get one of the hardest heart pieces in the game. 
And I'm only mentioning this because uh, this Harpies right here, for some reason, is the Harpies I have forgotten the most out of any run ever. Don't ask me why, but there's one random Harpies in the top of Earth Temple that requires you to fly up with a seagull to pick up. And I have missed this Harpies more than any other Harpies in the game. And then after I'm done with Earth Temple here, and we're going to Super Swim. Normally where you would go right here is you would go to the Gulf Island, which is two coordinates west of here. It's basically like the bottom left like island in the entire game. Uh, however, I'm going to do a quick stop. Earlier, uh, I accidentally used up a ferry and I was supposed to give it to Grandma. Thankfully, you actually just go by Grandma's house here either way. So I'm going to super quickly run up here and talk to grandma and just give her a ferry. Uh, this is technically not required for the 100% definition, but the route expects you to be able to refill your magic for many glitches. I'm sure you've noticed how useful the uh, leaf is at this point. There is also one additional glitch that you can perform with the soup. Um, which actually makes it so that you can completely break the watering tree sequence in the game. If you've ever tried to water all the trees, if you don't know what it is, you have to pick up some forest water in a forest haven, and then you have 20 minutes to water, I think it's eight different trees around the overworld. But if you have soup in one bottle, you can actually break that and kind of mess around with that 20 minute timer a little bit. Let's put it that way. So you're gonna see that glitch later on. Just take note of that right now. After getting the grandma soup, we're going to go over here. We're gonna get storage again. And then we're going to super swim all the way over to the golf island. If you thought that I was actually going to play golf, you're mistaken, okay? We're a speedrunner. We are not gonna play golf. Thankfully, this game has a plenty of glitches to let you skip the golf sequence. So first thing I'm going to do before I try any of that is I'm going to perform a glitch known as soup glitch. So I'm going to press the, bo uh, the button to drink my soup on the same frame I paused my game. And that lets me unequip the soup so I can drink it without it actually using any of the soup. Then I'm going to try and jump slash. And at the peak of my jump slash here, I get knocked forward to skip the first one. Then I'm going to go right here. I'm going to spawn these vines. Then I'm gonna jump, take out the leaf, turn to the left, press A to cancel it, and grab that ledge. And I have now skipped uh, two out of three of the golf sequences. Now, the only thing I have to do now is playing the last one. The last one spawns the actual chest, so it's the only one that is mandated to play. So, skip two out of the three, use the third one to spawn the chest. And we are now done with the Gulf Island. Now, we actually are still in a bit of trouble because I do need King of Red Lions to spawn. Thankfully, there is a secret cave on this island, which is also uh, required for 100%. And right here, I'm also going to make sure that I use ice on the last enemy because it doesn't then do like the death animation, which just speeds it up a little bit, saving a little bit of time. And then uh, we can pick up the chest. The next part that I want to go to is I want to go to Diamond Step because Diamond Step has the ghost ship chart. And the ghost ship chart is quite out of the way, so I don't want to get it later on. Now, there is no way to enter that island without having the hookshot, so I'm going to have to do another chest storage, which we like, okay, I've seen this a thousand times. Well, the issue here is that unlike every other time I get chest storage, here, I have to sail <laughs> in the dark. So I ha I've, I ha I've spent a lot of time practicing memorizing exactly where this boat is here so that I can just barely kind of get out. So hopefully if I do that, then do this turn around and then go right here. This should get me around the island. And hopefully once I leave this coordinate and the chest unloads, I should get my visuals back and we should have chest storage enabled. There we go. Perfect. Then while I'm over here, I'm going to open up my charts and I'm going to open up treasure chart number 23 and have that open. That is for obtaining the uh, hidden treasure on this island. And that one specifically is going to be a heart piece. To get into this island early, even though we have chest storage, we have to, I have to explain another mechanic that is very important to understand in Wind Waker, which is how the game tries to avoid you, I should say, from ever going underneath the ocean. So what the game does, if you're in a if you're in water 
and then there is water above you, it will always teleport you to the higher water source. And we actually use that to our advantage right there. Pick up the ghost ship shard and um, that's the whole island. So right now there's not too much going on. I'm going to super swim up two coordinates to go to one of the reefs. And this is going to be one of my first reef islands that I actually want to destroy. Then once I get there, I'm going to save and quit and we will just respawn back into the island. And now once I'm on the island, I have to just take down these cannons and all of these reefs will basically function the same way. I'm going to have to break these cannons and also if there's any gunboats or any enemies within the island, it actually counts as part of the reef. So this one, for example, counts as part of the reef. So I do also, I also have to take that enemy down. And I also want to make sure I don't forget to salvage one of the treasures here. And then I also do have to change the wind right here. If you've been paying close attention, you'll probably notice that I basically never change the wind. It is incredible how well routed this 100% category is. So I'm sure if you play this game casually, you will have remembered changing the wind like thousands of times in your playthrough. Especially if you're going for like a completionist playthrough, like 100% is. I think in the entire run, we changed the wind less than 10 times. I'm pretty sure the total wind direction changes is around six, I think. It's either five or six times. It's very, very little. We have just routed in each island so perfectly that every time you go to an island, wherever you need to go next is perfectly in the direction where you need to go. Just picked up that treasure chart. Now we're going to go and sail to the next island. And this is actually going to be for the gold ship. Now, the gold ship is a quite significant part of the game. If you beat in this game, you'll very much remember this gold ship. It's probably one of the hardest things to find in the game, in my opinion, to beat it. So on the, you know, GameCube version, you have eight Triforce charts. You decipher them a tingle. Then you can salvage the eight, uh, eight Triforce pieces, and then you're done. Japanese works a little bit different. You've probably never seen this before, but I'm going to beat this gold ship now, which should have a Triforce chart. What we are going to get instead is a treasure chart. But if I open up my map and I scroll through here, you will probably notice that this one I just picked up, number 16, has a red text while all the other ones are blue. And it goes to Shark Isle. Remember that for the future. Either way, once we pick that one up now, we're going to warp over to Forest Haven. And I'm going to pick up my first Forest Water. Okay, clip out of bounds. And we're going to use the same exploit that I mentioned earlier in Diamond Step to get into Forest Haven early. So by just like swimming underneath the loading zone, since the loading zone has water underneath it, and we'll teleport us to the top, it'll pop us in, and uh, we can just go straight into the loading zone and we officially are starting to be on this 20 minute timer right here we're going to take out the grappling hook we're going to grapple into the loading zone and this is where we can find our beautiful partner makar easily one of the best companions in any zelda game now after having received makar makar will just stay on king of red lines no matter where we go and we did just get that treasure chart on shark isle so i actually want to go and pick it pick it up so I'm going to get storage and do a super swim over to Shark Isle. Now, right here, since I want to salvage a treasure, I need to let Beetle spawn into the overworld and then go straight into his boat. And now let's go and salvage the red special Japanese treasure. So we are going to receive from our treasure chart another treasure chart. And this one, as you might have guessed, is also going to be with a red text now we're gonna water this tree remember we have to water all eight of them within 20 minutes or else we don't get the heart piece now it's not a total time loss to get these weird treasures i mean there's already stuff that we can do and we want to do on the islands themselves so once i get onto this island i'm gonna perform a save and quit to spawn king of red lions now there are two things that we want to get on this island one is water in the tree and two is a heart piece chest right here with a with a fire around it now, you're supposed to use a seagull to hit a switch at the very top, but there's actually a way you can skip the seagull here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stand here behind this eyes, and I'm going to use a fire arrow to aim at that bird you can see right there and shoot him. And even though the bird doesn't count as activating a switch, because he got lit on fire, it counts as a damage source. 
And with that specific angle and position, it will knock him into the switch, and then the fire surrounding the bird hits the switch, which opens up this chest, which means we can skip the slow seagull sequence. Then we go here, we water the tree. We can now finally go ahead and salvage this treasure right here. You might be able to make an educated guess what this red treasure chart will give us. That is right, the treasure chart which led to the treasure chart which led to the treasure chart led to another treasure chart. <laughs> so we are currently four treasure charts deep now and this treasure chart leads to another island. Now I would love to immediately go and salvage this treasure but I do want to make one more stop on the way here. I don't want to go immediately there for routing purposes. There is one more stop that we have to do. So we're going to go to Phi Eye Reef. These reefs are all being played exactly the same way. So I'm going to get on top of the island. I'm going to save and quit. I will spawn back, jump into the boat, destroy a bunch of the cannons around the island. And then I'm going to leaf over to the chest, get storage on the chest to initiate another super swim. This one is a longer super swim. I have to go almost four coordinates. Thankfully, this is one of the really good things about the reefs. The reefs are so glitched with its collisions that if you just swim into the corner, you get an area fill. I'm going to get even more speed than I already had. And then I'm going to angle myself for the very, very top of the map. Because I'm going all the way to the fairy island located by Dragon Roost, which is very far away. I also have to make sure I load Tower of the Gods right here. And that is so that a flag gets activated that actually completed Hyrule 2 because the game still doesn't know I've completed Hyrule 2. We're going to drop some forest water onto the tree. And this is going to be one of our first upgrades for our inventory. So this is going to be for getting an upgraded bomb bag, which is going to be very, very useful because you, there's a lot more reefs and squids around the game that I have to complete and it takes up a lot of bombs. All right, and now before we leave this island, we want to salvage the treasure that I just quote unquote discovered. Now, if you think that this is gonna lead to another treasure chart, you would actually be wrong because we're finally going to get another treasure chart. I'm just kidding. Of course it is. This version loves treasure charts. We got treasure chart 40 in red, which is the Earth Temple. To continue in the overworld, you wanna get the hook shot, so you wanna complete Wind Temple as quickly as you can. So I'm gonna head over to Wind Temple right now. Also, thankfully, unlike most cutscenes in this game, which requires you to skip the cutscene when you go to an island, because having a locked camera with the storage glitch soft locks the game, this one cutscene does not care. For some reason, the cutscene just does not care if you have the bat if you have this camera. It will just have a glitch camera throughout it and play. Now, just like uh, Earth Temple, you might be asking yourself, why can't you just do this dungeon without Makar? You could do glitches to enter the dungeon without Makar. The issue isn't entering the dungeon, it's the fact that there is one singular room that we have never figured out how to skip with Makar. And I'm going to show you which room that is. But because of one tiny robot, one tiny little room, we have to go through all these cutscenes. Thankfully, though, unlike Medley, which kind of just slows you down, uh, Makar actually speeds up a couple of these first rooms in a very, very nice, clever way. So I'm going to pick up Makar right here. And you're also going to see me side hop a lot, by the way. Uh, walking is just really slow. And since I can't roll while holding an NPC, we're just gonna be doing a lot of side hopping. Here's the reason why it's really convenient to have my car. So by having my car, I can spawn this chest. And this chest is just a super convenient way to get chest storage. I mean, that means you can start the dungeon with it. I can just walk up the tree, run on top of the switch, and then we will equip iron boots, fly up into the air and then we can just fly across the room. Here's where we're coming up on the areas where we can just not figure out how to skip my car. Planting these trees to open this door and planting the tree in the next room to open the next door are the two things that we can't skip. That's it. If we could just figure out a way to unlock this door and this next door without planting the trees, my car could be entirely skipped. Honestly, I love my car, so I don't really mind if he comes along. Plus, it's so nice. We're going to have him, you know, come along with us throughout this entire dungeon. So that's really sweet and cute either way, right? Nothing bad could ever happen to my car. Uh-oh. Well, 
That's unfortunate. Now, this is why we want to get chest doors. You see these, this door frame right here? This door frame is on every single door in this dungeon. Why am I mentioning this? Because the collision is so broken on this door that by just walking into the corner of it with storage, you clip through it. You don't have to get up on a ledge to do a like a roll clip like an earth temple. You don't have to find a special kind of like gap. No, just walk into the door frame. It works on every door. Every door in this dungeon has that door frame. And then here, I'm going to do a small little nice time save to get the hook shot. So instead of getting the hook shot and then having to use like the tutorial here to understand how to hit those pegs, I'm going to walk into the door frame. You can't see it, but I just walked into the door frame and then I get through into the loading zone. Now for this next room, I have to break all five of these floors right here to spawn a bonus chest that has a treasure chart. Now, normally how you're supposed to do this is break a floor, a set of enemies spawn down below, and then you have to fight them, go back up and do that five times. So you fight five rows of enemies. But if you stand at the very edge with your iron boots and you perform a jump slash, you can just barely get off without falling down. And then for the last one, because it will play a cutscene, I time taking on my iron boots right as the bomb explodes to get me off of it. So I can skip fighting all of the enemies down below. You can even hear right here probably when I use this bomb here to boost myself up on these spikes that the chews will get mad at me. Listen, you hear that sound? That was the chews down below because there's like 20, 30 enemies below waiting for me. But by doing that damage boost right there, I can get on top of here. I can get the small key. This is a treasure chart, so we do need to pick it up. But that does not mean that we don't want to get chest storage off of it. So I'm going to get chest storage. Then we're going to drop down right here. I'm going to equip all of these items right here. And this is basically the last thing that is used to skip my car. By just clipping into the bottom floor right here, I never have to open up the floorboards with my car there. And uh, all of those sections are now done. And now my objective is basically just to kill and take down all of the enemies in this area. I also want to warn you to be careful here. You want to make sure that the enemies you kill are always on camera when you're killing them. Because this room is so tall that it actually sometimes forgets that you killed an enemy and doesn't, doesn't count it. So you have to leave and come back in and then kill the enemy again a second time. Hopefully none of that happened. I was pretty careful with my camera position. Didn't happen that time good. So I need to continue to have chest storage enabled uh, to be able to skip the rest of this dungeon, but I still need the actual treasure chart. So we basically are gonna get chest storage with chest storage. And now here I have to be careful. So you're supposed to use my car here to turn off these winds but you can parkour around it. So land on the side of this fan, then walk here to the left, slash your sword to get to the very edge, zoom in, jump slash on top of this fan, jump off of it, and then land on this side. And now we're in the last couple of rooms for these spins right here, but just having the iron boots, we can get through this with side hops. And this is kind of like the last protection in the game to make sure you brought my car, this song stone right here, but we can just walk over it. <laughs> we are officially done with the dungeon. And look, the boss door has the same door collision as all the other doors in this game. So you can just walk through it. And then after all of that, glitching through the entire dungeon while still picking up everything required for 100%, it is in our inventory. If we open it up, they will be there. We now get rewarded with the best boss music in the game. A little fun fact, by the way, while this cutscene is playing, you can lose time as a speedrunner during this cutscene because it is actually luck-based how far he flies here. So he can take a longer path and you can lose like three seconds by him just flying around here a little bit longer. But either way, if you thought this boss fight was going to be normal, it's not. This is one of the few bosses where you can actually perform a one cycle. So I'm going to try and do that right now. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to hit him twice with the sword. The third hit will make him want to go back in. And then the bomb hits him the third time. Got it. Okay. Third hit, which is the bomb, hits it as I am hookshotting him. When that happens, the game has a failsafe in place. I messed that up the second time. Uh, the game has a failsafe in place to make sure that, hey, if somehow it took damage and it got interrupted, wait one second, and then once that one second has passed, then play the animation of him getting hurt. But if you hookshot him on the same frame that that, 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 that takes place, 
it will interrupt it and you can just then continue to attack without him flying around. So I was able to skip one of the phases, unfortunately, not all of them. And if that happens one time, now you have to deal with the mini Mulgaras right here. So it's not worth it anymore. At least you got to see how it works one time. If I were to have done that perfectly, I would have basically just repeated that glitch three times. Right there, you also probably noticed that I very carefully slashed my sword slowly and didn't do a quick spin. On the Japanese version, you can actually crash the game by defeating him, even with no glitches. It's related to sound effects, so if too many sound effects happen at the same time, then the game will never play this sound right here of boss defeated, which results in a crash. And the spin attack performs more sound, it's much more likely to happen. And if the mini Mulgaras jump at the same time as well, they create sound, and that can also increase the chance. So you want to try and be far away from the mini Mulgaras and do slow slashes, because then it's almost impossible. Here, though, I already have the fully charged Master Sword, so I'm just going to pick up the heart piece and save and quit and leave. I'm not actually going to enter the portal. I would just watch the cutscene an additional time for no reason. That's the entirety of Wind Temple completed 100%. And you can also see I got my fully upgraded sword back. If you look at the the B button. So what I didn't mention throughout this entire dungeon, by the way, is that I'm still on the timer for the forest water. If we look, I have two minutes and 36 seconds before my forest water runs out. And when that happens, the, th the two trees that I have already watered will ungrow and it would cause a lot of issues. So I have to play very fast to not have it run out and my ROM be basically dead. You can't mess up too many of the tricks, but being tight on time here is intended. And it is all thanks to Graham, actually. I'm going to water this. And then we're going to soup glitch over the forest water. So I'm going to try and drink the soup on the same frame I paused my game. And then I take out the forest water. What will happen now in my inventory is the forest water will no longer exist. I will just have two different soups. Because we duplicated over that bottle, it can never play that check at, hey, we hit zero. Make all of the trees go down. So it will stay forever grown unless I load them back into the overworld. If I ever go to the islands again that I have watered before I complete all eight of them, then the game will go, oh, wait, the forest water is no longer here. It should go down. So that means that starting now, I basically have an infinite amount of time to uh, to water all eight trees as long as I never return to any of the islands that I've already been at and this island as well I should clarify if I don't like if I don't get a quick super zoom and leave this island within probably about a minute minute and a half right now um this uh, this tree would also ungrow now I can just sail here normally so right here I have to get one of the wallet upgrades but thankfully it's such a short sailing section it's not really a big problem to go over here and this wallet upgrade is necessary not only for the 100% definition but also because um tingle is very greedy in this game and one thing that you might have noticed if you just like play way too much wind waker like me but maybe you haven't noticed is that the Japanese version has like no rupees around. Like whenever you go into like an Islet of Steel or any island like that, there's usually like one or 200 rupees on the English version. So that means that if you're just kind of thorough as you're playing through, you will get enough rupees. That's not the case in the Japanese version. Um, most of the rupees that are kind of placed in pots just don't exist. So I have to go ahead and basically use glitches to get enough rupees of what I'll need. Cause I'm gonna need about 5,000 rupees in this run. And you can see I'm currently at 378, despite having picked up all the big rupee pots that I've found so far. I'm gonna play Song of Passing right here and make it night because this is one of the islands where the ghost ship will be located. So by just playing Song of Passing right here, I can have the ghost ship spawn and I can pick up all the rupees because I want them right now because I'm about to go to my first tingle trip. The ghost ship will spawn in, we're going to enter it. And this is one of the things, this is like the only way you can farm rupees on the Japanese version, unless you wanna just play Play through Savage Labyrinth, which is how I think they intended the casual to do it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna grab this ledge, pick up these 300 rupees right here, then we're going to set ourselves up to have a perfectly straight angle, walk into this corner, and then what I'm going to do is drop a bomb, blow my leaf, side hop, 
grab the corner, go towards the bomb, which pushes me out of bounds. I will then void out on purpose, but because I void out, it reloads the room, which respawns the rupee pots that has 300 rupees. This might sound great. Like, oh my God, but 300 rupees, that's really good though. Yes, but that means that I have to do the same glitch over and over again about 15 times. Because I need 5,000 rupees. And even though I get 300 each time, it still takes a long time. So, I'm just going to speed through this for the, for the video's sake. You've just seen it twice, trust me. It's the same thing every time. So, I will see you on the other side once we have done this 15 times. Once we open up this chest right here, we will forever be locked out of the ghost ship. Uh, but yeah, now when that's done, we can finally get back to playing the game <laughs> and now we have to play this now this game is rng based but hopefully if i play well this shouldn't be too difficult the only thing if you ever want to play this in the future that you can know is it is luck based where they position themselves but it is always a different of five degrees they always buy at the five degree one so it's always like 40 45 etc so because 40 was too far i know it's 40 then it can't be like 42 so don't waste your shots doing that so that's a 40 that's a 40 and also i know i'm gonna get comments on it so i'm just gonna say it right now yes the biggest angle you can have is 50 i know it doesn't technically make sense because 45 should be the biggest angle but in wind waker they don't care about physics okay 50 is the biggest one it's 5 to 50 <laughs> And there is both a heart piece and a treasure shark. There are two rewards from this island. So once you've done it twice, we are done. And we are now ready to leave this guy forever. That's it. That's that's the end of his minigame sections. There's no more minigames to play. Sorry, Chad. I know you love your sploosh kaboom and your cannon minigames, but that's it. No more. Hi, Tingle. Our favorite friend in the game, Chad. Now, I'm not actually going to talk to him too long. I only want to decipher the first three charts because A, I don't have all eight yet. And B, I'm only going to go by the islands for the first three until I return to him. So we're going to decipher three of them and then we're going to come back later on. Now we're going to super zoom down to Stone Watcher. So here's another beautiful example of optimization when it comes to combat. So in this room right here, there is a big delay in between light arrow shots that you can do. So what I'm going to do here is take out a bomb as I open up the door. And then I'm going to throw it to the right, ice him, bomb explodes the ice, then shoot light arrow, and he's instantly dead. Like, there's so many really cool strats like that that you can do in these combat sections where it's not actually faster to use lighter or everything, but you combine a bunch of different tech. And here you can, by the way, see another, like, Japanese change. On the North American or European version, you would see, like, two pots around this that would have about 200 rupees-ish, but none here. There's just nothing. <laughs> now, once I'm out here, I'm going to finally open up one of my Triforce charts, because it is finally time to get the first piece of cheese. <laughs> After five hours, we are finally at a position where we're ready to start picking up some cheese. And one out of eight. All right, now we're just going to do a couple of overworld stuff. We are going to be heading over to Outset, and we're going to do a couple of different things. There are some tedious parts of this and there's also some fun parts and some mean parts there's a lot to do on the outside trip we're going to head over to savage labyrinth now savage labyrinth if you don't know is kind of like you go to a floor you have a bunch of enemies you kill them it opens up to the next floor and there's a total of 50 floors at floor 30 you will get a triforce chart which is what we actually need and then floor 40 and 50 are completely optional so there is no need to go there whatsoever even for 100 percent speed run by the way different between japanese version look at the green rupees i'm getting here on any other version you're gonna get like nice rupee drops in between these floors I just got like basically what was like, what, 20 rupees or something like that. Like, I cannot overstate how much Nintendo hated <laughs> everyone for playing this version. They're like, man, we are going to make them farm for so long. And that is officially floor 20. We have 10 more floors left. Now is when things start to get really fast. So... Unlike the previous floors, we actually had to fight all of the enemies. Here, you can actually do a skip. So what you want to do is you want to take out your hookshot, and then you want to go into this corner, hookshot this lantern, and then you have to, within the first three frames of standing up, start holding your hookshot button again, and then release it at a perfect time. 
what will happen is because he's in his like standing up animation he will be still kind of be facing downwards because he hasn't fully stood up yet which will uh, aim towards the bottom of that torch and then if i let go quickly enough i will still have invisibility frames um meaning that i will go through the fire without getting hit a second time and I will touch the loading zone. Anyways, now we're on floor 30. I'm going to pick up these uh, two pots right here. And we're going to get a couple of rupees. Now, after I've gotten some of the rupees, I'm not going to open up this chest yet. Because despite having farmed 5,000 rupees in the ghost ship, I am a few rupees short still of having all that I need. But this is thankfully one of the other rooms where you can farm rupees. It's a lot slower and harder, but it's like the only other place we have in the game uh, on the Japanese version. So I'm going to get chest towards right here, do two side hops, and then just hold forward. And then I will go over here and I will basically just like void out. Now, if you're confused about how that void out works, with Chesterwich, I can walk up these pillars right here on the side. But by walking into the pillar here, you can see that there's a thing above my head. It will basically just crush me. Now we're going to get the last rupees and we are officially set. And that is the end of Savage Labyrinth. And if you're curious, by the way, because it didn't open up that chest, since I stored it, it is a my inventory. Now, this is the biggest meme heart piece in the game. I am not going to make you watch this whole thing. This is Orca. He gave you the original sword. And if you come back, you can go into this mini game where you have three hearts and then you can hit him. He says that he wants to see if you can get a score of 100. If you do that, you will get rupees. He will then ask you to get 300. And then he will give you more rupees. However, if you continue for some reason to 500, he will give you a heart piece. There is one additional reward after the heart piece, which is 999. Then he just screams enough and knocks you over. He then proceeds to break the, th the fourth wall and make fun of you and say, wow, your finger must be hurting from holding the target button so long. Uh, I would recommend you to watch a YouTube video to confirm that instead of doing it yourself. But that's actually what happens. It takes about five minutes to get through all of these hits. And there's not much you can do to speed it up. You can just basically try and press B. It's faster to not do a combo because you get more attacks in before he just says enough and just kind of attacks you. Now, once we have 500, we let him hit us on purpose so that we basically lose. Very nice nice and then there's one more thing we want to do here before we leave we're also going to hand him the night crests and he will teach you the hurricane spin uh it's not super useful but it's really cool uh it looks like this you charge up your master sword and then you do this <laughs> That's it. So you just like spin around for 10 seconds automatically like that. There is one more thing we want to get while we're on outset, which is the, uh, we want to bring the big pig over to the other side of the island because he can dig up a heart piece. But there is a new strat to do this. So before you used to actually walk with him all the way over there. But now you can do a weird displacement glitch. So put him in between the NPC and Link. And if you get the angle just right, it will displace him like this. You will look over here, and then you will throw the pig. <laughs> and he flies all the way over to the other side of the island. And there's the harpies. And that is everything on outset, 100%. And now we are on to more overworld stuff. Now, once I leave this island and I'm over here, we are going to finally pick up something that I talked about a while ago. After five treasure charts and going back to this island, we can finally salvage treasure chart 40. And after all of that, we get the Triforce chart. So if you thought that it was a bad time to get the eight Triforce charts on the North American version, just be happy you didn't have the Japanese version. You have to get five additional treasure charts. You might be wondering, how is this possibly faster than the North American version? And I want to remind you once again, the text alone saves 20 minutes compared to English. So despite having to get all the extra treasure charts and the rupee grinding and everything, that only adds about, I think it's about eight minutes of time to the run. Now, after this, we are going to head over to Bomb Isle. And now here, we're finally going to start trading again with the Gorons. It was like, I think we traded with the Gorons about an hour into this run. So it's been like four hours since we were last trading. But this is the next trading quest. Oh yeah, by the way, a little fun Easter egg in case you've never seen it. I'll show you a quick Easter egg right here in case you've not seen it before. 
if you use the DQ Leaf on a Goron, you blow his hat off and you actually get to see the Goron's face. Cool fun fact. We're going to go to Flight Control Platform, which is one of the only minigame islands that I have left. And I also think uh, it's probably one of the harder ones. So if you do the cashable strat that you're intended to do, it is legitimately hard. Like, you need double magic, but even if you have double magic, you can get legitimately screwed over by, like, the wind. How this minigame should work, right, is you start the minigame, you try perfectly with double magic, with the perfect wind to fly to the end, hope the, the little winds doesn't screw you over, and you can get to the end. But that's slow, so we're not going to do that. So I'm going to line up here. I'm going to walk a little bit forward, place down a bomb, walk a little bit backwards. It doesn't want to pick it up. And then I'm going to jump slash, have the bomb explode me onto the invisible ledge, and now clip out of the minigame. Now, the minigame is still active, I and I haven't touched the water, so I haven't lost. Unfortunately, the developers were smart in this situation. They actually thought, what if somehow you go out of bounds? I don't know why, but they thought it. So, if you go out of bounds during this minigame, it actually counts as you losing. So, right now, minigame starts but it knows I left the boundaries. So if I go to the end of the finish line, it will just give me an instant loss. This is once again where we have to outsmart the developers. So if we just jump in the water here, I would lose the game. But you see it's night right now. Well, the route is so cleverly made that it actually wants to be day. Why am I mentioning this? Well, because if you play Song of Passing, the game forgets that you cheated. So the route is made so good that it turns now night during the minigame. So you have to play Song of Passing to make it day anyways for Windfall where we're going next. But also by playing Song of Passing, the game just forgets that we cheated. We left the out of bounds boundaries. So then it just says new record and it rewards us with completing the minigame. And after that, we can go straight to Windfall and complete everything that we're missing there. So then we're going to talk to Anton one time, talk to him twice. Then we're going to show him this picture of Linda, who's a girl he has a crush on. Now, if we talk to him one last time, what that will do is he will decide, okay, you know what? This girl is so pretty, even though he keeps looking at her, by showing a picture and talking to him, you basically convince him that he needs to go on a date. Don't ask me why, it's just how the game works. So after doing all of that, I'm going to go over here to this step and show this guy a picture of the full moon. And now I just need to make one more day go by because he just needs one day from showing him the picture to being convinced, you know what, I'm going to take her on a date. And then once one day has passed, we can just enter this cafe and the date should be happening. And beautiful, there are dates in the background. First, I'm going to talk to this mailman, this Rito. He's going to give me Maggie's letter. I started that way earlier. Then I'm going to talk to them and get the heart pieces. I thank you for, you know, making them fall in love. Very sweet, very kind. Then we're going to go over to Miss Marie, which is secretly one of the richest people on all of Wind Waker for some reason, despite being an elementary school teacher. So first, by showing her and giving her one joy pendant, she will give you 20 rupees. Kind of normal. Then by giving her 20 more joy pendants, she will gift you a private island that she owns. Don't ask me why. If you give her another 20 joy penance, she will give you the hero's charm. And this basically means that if you target an enemy or you enter a boss fight, you will get a health bar. So every enemy and every single boss will from now on have a health bar. Then after I've done that, we're gonna go up to the rich house. First, we're gonna go to her dad and by giving him 20 skull necklaces, uh, which he's then gonna give to her his daughter. He will give us a treasure chart. And then last but not least, we are going to be a mailman and deliver Maggie the love letter in between the Moblin and herself, which I know it's weird, don't question it. He basically says that he dreams of eating her. Uh, it's it's really weird. Like, I when I'm eating her, I mean like literally like, help. <laughs> now, after all of that, and we respawn back in this dock, I'm going to do another super swim. And, oh God, I don't like this mask when I'm super swimming. I might actually take this mask off. Sorry, Chad. <laughs> I'm now going to super swim really far, actually. This is one of the further super swims I'm going to have to do. I'm going to go to Mother and Child Isle. I'm never going to enter the island, because then I just get a cutscene of downgrading my bow and arrow to a simple fire eyes and arrow. But I'm going to go here specifically so that I can trade with this Goron. 
Now, this route is very well planned, not only with taking into consideration these Quarons, but also that at least one in-game day has passed, because you can only trade three day three times in between each Quaron, and then it one day has to pass before you can trade again. But anyways, after trading, I'm gonna get storage again, and then we're just onto some more overworld stuff, so like reefs, fairy islands, you name it. If you want to try and 100% Windbaker, pay attention to this. This is the, one of the hardest uh, heart pieces to find for 100%. If you ever tried 100% and you were like 18 or 19 hearts, I promise you this is probably one of them. Every single gunboat in the game, every one of these, have nothing to drop of value. Except for this one. On Rock Spire, there's two gunboats to spawn. And the one that spawns furthest away, so the most south, is the only gunboat in the entire game where its treasure isn't rupees or like a spoil. It is instead a heart piece. So if you've ever missed the heart piece, I promise you this is probably the one. It is just one of the most random things ever. It's like nothing to indicate that this one has a heart piece. I'm gonna go back to uh, Forest Haven right here, and this is the uh, this is going to be part two of um the watering tree sequence so i'm gonna pick up some forest water right now and this is the last time i'm starting my like 20 minute timer and then the last thing i need from forest haven before we leave it is the last thing in the game left for a forest haven and then we never have to come back is treasure shard number 31 which is the last treasure now we're going to super swim to cabana deed where we have our own private island thank you Miss Marie. So a couple of things we can do here. So first, we want to water this tree. We want the hookshot. And we also want the proof that we can show the butler that we actually own this island now. And then here are the last rupees that we actually need in the run. We're going to get right here as well. Um, after this, we are done with all the rupees. Uh, you're supposed to crawl through kind of a maze underground right here. But the skull hammer has such a big hitbox, by the way. But you can just skull hammer the wall, and if you have a slight side angle and you know where the, the switch is on the other side, you can hit it. So you can see right there that I just hit both of them through the wall, and that lets me skip the entire place. And here is the final Triforce chart in the game. This is it. That's all of them. Now we just have to decipher them a tingle, and then start salvaging the Triforce pieces. On the way as we're doing that, we'll pick up the last, you know, hard pieces we're missing. We're almost there, and um, we have 100% of the game. Now, it looks like you're not getting anything from that, by the way. I traded him 20 gold feathers, and all I get back was 100 rupees. But he will mail you a letter letter. Uh, um, he will mail you a letter later, and that letter will contain a heart piece. I want to go up to pick up one of the Triforce pieces and water one of the trees. But there is no close places where I can get a good storage spot here. So what you have to do is you have to rely on not only playing well, but also get good luck with how the water is like bouncing up and down right here. So what you have to do is you have to stand here, hook shot here, jump slash, and hope that it's angled in such a way. Because when you're hook shotting an object that's moving, it can kind of put Link in a position he shouldn't be. Now we have to hope that when I jump slash, it does that. Exactly. You can see right there how he like it glitched Link upwards. That's basically the effect that I need to have happen, but it actually puts me on top of the submarine like that. Once I'm up on it, now I can go for a storage spot on this here. Once it gets storage, I can now store this chest right here to have chest storage. And I'm going to keep this chest storage for like the next minutes. Like I'm going to keep this for a while. And you're going to see why in a little bit. I can stand against this wall right here, take out my hook shot. And because I'm like partially inside of the wall, I can hook shot. There we go. I can hook shot the chest from below through the island onto here and then just open up the chest is canceling my chest storage so now i'm set i don't have to worry about it anymore and i get the treasure chart and then also i can just water this tree right here and this is officially the last item upgrade that i have this is going to give us the quiver for 99 meaning that starting now we should have all of the items in the game except for magic armor which is the last item that i'm going to be picking up other than that it's just like a couple of treasure charts 
and heart pieces. This route, by the way, is made to be very tight in terms of time. So if you see right now when I'm coming to Great Fish, I have to water the tree and I have two minutes left. They made sure when they made this route that you would not have a lot of spare time because I have two minutes left and I have two trees to water. And as long as I didn't mess up and accidentally load an island I wasn't supposed to, this tree should grow right now into a big thing and give me the harpies. And we are officially at 19 and a half hearts. Then I'm going to trade with this Goron one time. This is it. That's the final trade. And we now have all of it. This is just the thing we need to give now to get a heart piece. And we're actually going to use a really cool little mechanic here. So remember how I warped to Greatfish and I was at Greatfish? I'm going to go into the middle of the water here and then save and quit. Might seem really strange that I'm even bothering mentioning this. But this is used very cleverly. Because since I was far away from the island and I say warped in the water, the game doesn't know where to put me. So it puts me back to the last main island that I was considered to be at, which happens to be Greatfish, which is also where not only is there a Triforce piece left that I didn't pick up yet, but this is where I give the last traded statue to, to receive my heart piece to complete the Goron trade. This is the end Goron. This is the Goron that you start the trading with, and this is the one you end with. So that means I didn't have to waste a bunch of time to like warp back. But instead, I could just do a quick save and quit. And I'm back where I should be. And there is the last item. Now we have one singular thing left to receive a 100% completion. Which is all 20 heart containers. Remember earlier how I mentioned that there were three main reasons you want to do barrier skip in this run. And one of them being that you can skip the long slow tedious sequence of going down to Hyrule 3 and getting all the cutscenes of like hey we're going to beat the game cutscenes well one heart piece is hidden at the Forsaken Fortress so I'm going to combine going to Forsaken Fortress to go to the end of the game with getting the final heart piece that is 20 hearts so 20 hearts double magic every single item in the inventory and every single upgrade to have 99 quivers and bombs, everything on the quest screen, every single song, full Triforce, fully charged master, mirror shield, power bracelets, gossip stone, hero's charm, the three pearls, 49 treasure charge, which is the total amount in the game because that's the amount of squares there are. That is it, a 100% completion. There is only one thing left, beating the game. Now, if you don't know how Papa Ganon should work, what you're supposed to do is use the boomerang, cut down his cord, and then slowly hit him. He goes back up, he heals himself, and you do that over and over again. But we're a speedrunner. That's slow. So I'm going to attempt, hopefully well, to snipe him as he's moving around. Not only is it really difficult and precise, but it's also luck-based how he moves. So you kind of have to navigate and kind of react to how his tail is moving. And that's three. Beautiful. For the second phase, uh, you can do something called a Crypt Shot, uh, named after Cryptic, who found this uh, shot. Basically, there's a frame-perfect shot you can do where you hit him one time, aim up left, and then frame-perfectly release your bow for a second shot. If you time it perfectly, then you can get two shots in at once, resulting in it being a two-cycle. You get two attempts on it. Hopefully, we can nail it. Let's see if we can. Slightly too early. Angle perfect, though. I hit the timing, but the platform was in the way. Okay, well, anyways, it basically would just hit it right there. That's so unlucky. There is one more strat you can do to speed this boss fight up compared to a, a normal person. So on phase three, I'm going to shoot him. I will go for this. It's called Trog Shot. He's the one who developed the task for this. It basically means you just kind of YOLO shot up into the air and hit the ball as he's being hurt. But, I mean, there's a reason it's a YOLO shot. If you see his tail right there, yeah, like, there is, there's not a lot of leeway. But you can still speed this up. Like, you can see I'm still shooting him when he's on the ground. So, yeah, unfortunately, no throg shot, but still a very fast third phase. Two super quick shots right there, nonetheless. Still a good fight. We take those. Now, all we have to do is do this last climb and enter Ganon's room. Um, there is still some speed tech left to speed this up because this last room is still really slow to go up in. 
because, you know, there's a big rope you have to climb, and then you have to grapple something, and then you have to grapple a second thing, and then hook shot up to the final platform. The first thing you can do is because of how long this rope is, and it starts to swing from the top slowly down to the bottom, with good mashing, you can actually jump off and on on it before it has time to start swinging for a period of time to go up about two thirds of the way until about now. Now you want to stop. And you can see still if I aim down, I made it most of the way up very quickly without having to do the slow climb. Then here is when I'm supposed to do the first out of two grapples, but you can skip that as well by doing a jump slash, turn around, backflip, 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 slash, backflip with shield. He clips through the ground without getting crushed. That's why you have to do that setup, otherwise he gets crushed. And now to get up on the final platform, instead of grapple hooking, you can just hook shot that ledge from a precise spot. Side hop, side hop, go up to the final one, and we're done. It is time for the final Ganon fight. I also probably noticed that it looks pretty normal right here. That's because it is. We didn't have any weird flags or any no weird glitches to get up here. We 100% of the game. Listen up, Link. You take this sword, and I promise I won't accidentally hit you with my light arrow. All right, I trust you. Uh, before this fight starts, I'm immediately going to drink some of Grandma's soup. In case you don't know, if you don't get hit by something, so you lose health, you have double damage output with Grandma soup. So it makes this fight a lot faster. Then I'm waiting for this parry attack. Walk under him. Press A right before he lands. Quick spin, quick spin, quick spin. And one cycle because Grandma Soup. And then we just need to talk to Zelda. She's going to shoot an arrow on our mirror shield. It will hit Ganon. That was the fastest arrow I have ever seen. Okay. <laughs> and then we walk up. And time there it is wind waker 100 in seven hours and if you want to like have a rough idea usually this is about a six to seven hour run but anyway that's it uh thank you so much for watching this video nonetheless i hope you enjoyed this full breakdown of a wind waker 100 speed run if you want to see these speedruns live you should definitely check out my twitch channel because hey you can be part of those guys right there uh, we have a great time, and I'm doing plenty of attempts like this, and I'm trying to go for world record in this category in the near future, so I'm going to try and go for a sub six hour time. A lot of resets, but it's still going to be a lot of fun, so don't forget to check that out. If you want to see two more awesome videos, by the way, that you can click on the screen right now. Uh, but that being said, thank you so much for watching this video. I really appreciate that, and I will see you all in the next one. Later, everybody. Bye-bye.